So the meeting has started. And Justice, would you like to open the meeting? Yes, good morning. I am Patricia Guerrero. This is the meeting of the Blue Ribbon Commission for the future of the California Bar. I will ask that the call, uh, I'm sorry, call the roll, please. Sure. Alex Chen. Charles Duncan. Present. Jeremy Evans. Ryan Harrison. Tracy Montes. Present. Natalie Rodriguez. Present. Emily Scovelero. Present. Karen Silverman. We have, um, and also Joshua Pertula. Yeah, here. Okay. We have a quorum, Justice. Thank you very much. Again, welcome everybody. This is our fifth meeting of the Blue Ribbon Commission. I hope you are all doing well. And for the members of the public listening in, I wanted to uh, just repeat the charter for our commission. Um, we are charged with developing recommendations concerning whether and what changes to make to the California bar exam and whether to adopt alternative or additional testing or tools to ensure minimum confidence to practice law in California. We will be continuing today in the format that we're currently in, which is subgroups, one focused on discussing a pathway that includes an exam and another that focuses on non-exam alternatives. And this morning's session is focused on the exam alternative meeting from 9 to 12.30. I will um, begin first before we begin with business with the public comment period and discuss some of the logistics as follows. Um, as noted in our agenda, the public comment portion of the meeting is limited and members of the public who wished to comment were encouraged to submit their written comments before the meeting today. And we have received written public comments. There were a couple and we thank the public for submitting those. Uh, I will soon ask the commission coordinator to call any members of the public in the order that they appear. And we request that you please limit any comments you may have to two minutes and ask also that you please not repeat any points that were covered in either written submissions or by any prior speakers. And logistics for commenting, for those who are participating through the Zoom video format, you should have a function that allows you to virtually raise your hand, which is a hand icon and it should appear at the bottom center of your screen. So if you wish to make a public comment, please click on that. And also for anybody participating by phone, you can also virtually raise your hand uh, by pressing star and the number nine, again, the star key, then the number nine. And the coordinator will call members of the public in the order that they appear. So Ms. Wong, I would ask you to please do that if there are any public comments. Yes, Justice. Um, I would like to start with um, Mr. Julius um, Sarkars. Mr. Sarkar. Uh, thank you. Um, good morning. My name is Julian Sarkar. I represent attorney applicants against the unlawful practices of the state bar and the NCBE. And in light of the NCBE's additional participation today, I want to remind this commission that any grant, any contract granted to the NCBE following this uh, commission's proceedings will be a completed criminal violation of our state's criminal uh, conflict of interest laws in government code section 1090. And it's my intention to have the fair political practices commission uh, prosecute the NCBE's crimes to the fullest extent of the law. 
But aside from furthering the NCBE's illegal conduct, I want the members of this commission to consider the wider implication of continuing to grant lucrative contracts to the NCBE. The NCBE has made its white and male supremacist purpose quite clear in publications over the past century uh, when it hired doctors Roger Bullis and Stephen Klein to argue that blacks and women possess inferior legal skills. An honest analysis would have included uh, the NCBE's homogeneously white attorney staff who have never even tried to take their own bar exams, which uh, if we were apply to apply their own metrics and standards would mean that they have no legal skills at all. Last year, the NCBE authored yet another publication to make these arguments against black and female attorney applicants, urging bar examiners to proceed with bar exams uh, despite the pandemic. After nearly a century of developing bar exams, the NCBE's strongest bar argument for the validity of their exams is, I quote, this is not the place to respond to the unfounded and unsubstantiated criticisms that some commenters are directing at the bar exam. Uh, actually, if you look at the NCBE's own research, uh, that it finds that their own exams are, I quote, the MBE tests arcane, obscure, or trivial aspects of the law that new practitioners should not be expected to know and are not reflective of minimum competence. The MBE tests only memorization and no skills. The MBE questions are full of red herrings and inten intentionally tricky. Um, if the NCVE has failed to serve a purpose that's beneficial to society in the past nine decades, there's no reason to believe that it'll change for the better in the next few years. In 2018, our legislature uh, amended the State Bar Act to define protection of the public to, I quote, include support for greater access to and inclusion in the legal system, specifying that it is the intent of the legislature that the State Bar maintain its commitment to and support of effective policies and activities to enhance access, fairness, diversity in the legal profession, and the elimination of bias in the practice of law. So beyond the criminality of the NCBE successfully obtaining any further contracts uh, from the State Bar through this commission, it is also directly contract contrary to the California people's legislative will to continue delegating uh, gatekeeping to that white supremacist organization whose attorneys are too privileged for the re requirement of their own bar exam. So I urge this commission to reject any further relationship with the NCBE and to cooperate with the California Fair Political Practice Commission's investigation and prosecution of the NCBE and those who aided and abetted them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sarkar. At the moment, Justice, uh, we do not have any other public comments. So it's gonna be conclude, we're gonna conclude this public comment period. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Mr. Sharkar for your continued participation. We also received your written comments for today's meeting. And we'll go ahead and close the public comments and move to the business portion of today's agenda. And I wanted to announce that there's going to be a slight change in the order and we will begin with the update regarding the next gen examination and we'll be joined here by the following speakers which i would like to welcome and introduce uh, kelly early judith gunderson danette mckinley and mark raymond welcome thank you thank you very much can you hear me yes okay good well, hello everyone. And I think um, I just wanna make sure that we've got the slides showing. Okay, that's that's great. Thank you very much. I'm just gonna quick pull up my, my notes here. Uh, well, thank you Justice Guerrero and subcommittee members for inviting us to speak at your meeting. We are pleased to be able to provide you with updates on our next gen bar exam work, what milestones we anticipate completing soon and what still is under consideration and study on this multi-year project. Uh, so the next slide, please. My name is Judy Gunderson. I'm the president of NCBE, and I'm really proud of the work that our staff, the testing task force, and the implementation steering committee, and the teams of volunteers have already done on the next gen bar exam. We really believe that this project will benefit candidates and the profession by offering an exam for the 21st century that's of the highest quality, is affordable, is fair and accessible to all examinees, offers robust skills testing and retains score portability to give examinees maximum flexibility and freedom in job seeking and serving clients in the public. With me today are three key staff members involved in the NextGen project. 
Kelly Early is our Chief Strategy Officer. She's the former Executive Director of the Missouri Board of Law Examiners. Before working with the Missouri Board of Law Examiners, Kelly practiced law in St. Louis and Los Angeles. Kelly's been responsible for steering this project from conception to completion. She's the Implementation Steering Committee's Coordination Strategy and Outreach Work Group Lead. Dr. Danette McKinley is NCBE's Director of Diversity, Fairness, and Inclusion Research. She has decades of experience in the licensure and certification of health professionals and was responsible for developing and implementing a research agenda supporting the mission and activities of the Educational Commission for Foreign Medical Graduates and its Foundation for Advancement of International Medical Education and Research. Danette is the ISC's DFI work group lead. Dr. Mark Raymond is NCBE's Director of Test Design and Delivery. He's worked for and advised certification boards, licensing agencies, and professional associations for the past 30 years, most recently as the Director of, as the Research Director and Principal Assessment Scientist for the National Board of Medical Examiners. Mark conducts research and consults on matters ranging from test design to psychometric modeling. He's been instrumental in guiding the research phases of the NextGen project and continues to be involved with NextGen measurement and test design issues. They each bring a wealth of experience to the NextGen exam and they are part of a larger team of staff and volunteers committed to this project. Next slide, please. I'll give a quick overview of how we got here and what our timeline is for moving forward. Kelly Early will talk about the content scope work and prototyping work done thus far. Danette McKinley will cover fairness and accessibility principles in general on a high stakes exam. And we'll talk specifically about we are what we're planning on the next gen exam. And Mark Raymond will talk about the psychometric procedures needed to support the reliability and validity of the exam. We ask that you hold your questions until the end of our presentation and we'll answer them then. Next slide, please. So early on in our study, the task force adopted the following claim for the intended use of scores from the bar exam, to protect the public by helping to ensure that those who are newly licensed possess the minimum knowledge and skills to perform activities typically required of an entry level lawyer. In this context, what's the purpose of the bar exam? Over the course of our three-year study, we identified the objectives on your screen, which would shape the next-gen exam. So in 2018, as you know, we started by getting qualitative information via focus, group and focus groups and listening sessions with over 400 stakeholders. We followed that phase in 2019 with a nationwide practice analysis that amassed a rich set of quantitative data revealing the job requirements of newly licensed lawyers, including the tasks most critically and frequently performed, as well as the knowledge, skills, and abilities important to the performance of those tasks. These two phases then laid the foundation to move ahead last year with our test blueprint committee uh, recommendations, what should the bar exam test, and the test design committee recommendations, how should that content be tested? But even be, before we started our research, we knew that affordability would be very important to jurisdictions and to law school graduates. And we also knew, and we heard from stakeholders that fairness and accessibility should be cornerstones in designing the next gen exam. Dr. McKinley will talk more about our commitment to fairness and accessibility on this exam. And finally, our stakeholders underscored the importance of maintaining score portability. And our data corroborate that new lawyer portability is an important feature of the uniform bar exam. Over the 10 years that the uniform bar exam has been administered, over 190,000 people have earned a UBE score and over 35,000 of those bar exam scores have been transferred across jurisdictions. So that's 35,000 examinees who would have had to take an additional bar exam even just a few years ago, but for the concept of score portability. Next slide, please. 
So you've seen this graphic before, uh, the final testing task force recommendations that came out about a year ago. Kelly will give you an update on the content uh, to let you know the work that we're doing and the progress that we've made and what lies ahead. We are also currently exploring and working on test delivery models and options. They are all, those are works in progress. Like the current bar exam, the scoring model on the next gen bar exam will be compensatory. That is a single combined score for making admissions decisions. Compensatory scoring reflects a candidate's overall proficiency and allows areas of strength to compensate for areas of weakness and generally is considered fairer to candidates than scoring models that require separate hurdles. We have not yet devised the score scale for the next gen exam, nor have we done a standard setting exercise, but we anticipate setting a new score scale and we anticipate undergoing a standard setting exercise to assist jurisdictions in setting their standard. And of course, what has been settled is that the exam will be given after law school and offered twice a year. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide summarizes the content to be covered on the exam, the foundational concepts and principles and foundational skills. Our adoption of the term foundational to describe the concepts, principles, and skills to be assessed, to be assessed was intentional. And the specifications are being carefully aligned with minimum competence for entry-level practice. The test content specifications will not only reflect the content covered on the exam, but will also identify sources of law where necessary for clarity to ensure that they are clear and helpful to candidates who are preparing for the exam. On these um, foundational concepts and princip principles, all MBE topics are covered with the addition of business associations. So I think that for every jurisdiction, certainly that uses the UBE right now, this next gen exam will test on fewer substantive areas, but will have increased skills testing. Our research indicated that these were the eight areas that had the highest ratings in the practice analysis and our volunteer test blueprint committee and the TTF approved. As with the foundational concepts and principles in 2022, there will be more information coming about the seven foundational skills, including an outline, including skill de skills definition and examples of practice activities that represent each skill. Um, next slide, please. Now this slide, I think you've seen this before too. I think Judge Martin didn't have this at the time. She spoke to your group back in July, but it's a timeline that essentially maps out where we'll be going over the next five years. As you will note in the first quarter um, of 2022, there are some milestones that will be met. And I will turn it over to Kelly because Kelly is gonna talk a little bit about some of these milestones that we're ready to eat or meet regarding, uh, regarding prototyping and content specifications. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kelly early. Thank you. Unmuted here. I'm unmuted. Um, next slide, please. Thanks very much, Judy. And thank you all for inviting us. It's a pleasure to speak with you today and let you know about the progress we've been making um, over this past year. Um, as Judy mentioned, I'm going to be talking about the work that we're doing, um, that our content scope committee has been doing, in fact, and then where we have um, made some progress in starting with drafting uh, item prototypes. Um, next slide, please. So, our content scope committee, looks like my graphic might be missing, but the, but the uh, important stuff is there. Um, we convened a content scope committee um, earlier this year. We uh, issued an invitation to um, members of the, the legal academy, bar examiners, uh, practitioners uh, to apply to serve on this committee. And we had a very great response to that. 
Um, we assembled the committee and their purpose or charge was to make recommendations to the implementation steering committee regarding how broadly and deeply to assess the uh, subjects, the foundational concepts and principles or FCP as we refer to them and the skill areas identified as Ju Judy mentioned uh, through our testing task force study. Next slide, please. So we selected 21 members. Three of those members um, are actually from California. We have two um, relatively newly licensed lawyers who are uh, licensed and practicing in California. And we also have uh, an associate dean uh, from one of the California law schools serving on our content scope committee. That committee just completed its final meeting as a group. Um, on last Friday, December 3rd, we have draft reports from the committee on each of the eight FCP uh, areas, as well as a draft report on the foundational skills. We will be um, doing some additional work with uh, uh, those reports, but um, the progress has been great. As you can see, we strove um, in selecting members for that committee to make sure we had a well-rounded group, not only in terms of um, their role um, as either educators or bar examiners, uh, practitioners, um, and what jurisdictions and law schools we drew from. We tried to get an even balance uh, between in gender as well as have a divide, diverse group uh, from a variety of backgrounds. And they have been, uh, really, really fantastic uh, group of individuals who've been very, very enthusiastic and dedicated to their work. Next slide, please. So a significant uh, part of their work has been defining the breadth and depth of coverage. Um, as I mentioned, that's what their charge was. And in looking at what the breadth of coverage should be, um, we have had them start um, by working with the subject matter outlines for the current um, exam, uh, because as Judy mentioned, the seven MBE subjects will still be tested and business associations, which is currently tested in the MBE will also be tested. And so we have um, developed blueprints or uh, subject matter outlines already on these areas of law that cover what we're currently testing, and we use that as a starting point. Um, they have relied upon other resources and brought their own experience and expertise to the table as well. But in looking through those outlines and all the other documentation they've been looking at, they've been guided in the breadth of coverage by trying to think about how frequently does this um, topic under a um, FCP areas such as contracts. How often does this come up in entry level practice? Um, is this topic uh, common to multiple practice areas? Because we're um, very um, uh, much aware of the fact that it is a general license to practice and we find so much um, overlap in terms of what the knowledge is that newly licensed lawyers need to have. Uh, so when an area is common to multiple practice areas, that seems to um, stress its importance for including uh, in the entry, um, the licensure exam to enter the pr practice. And then finally, we also have them take into consideration risk. So even if um, a particular topic may not come up frequently or be uh, universal um, as um, a licensure exam whose purpose is to provide public protection. Uh, if a topic would create a significant risk of malpractice or poor client outcomes, if the newly licensed lawyer did not have knowledge in that area, we consider it important for including um, in the licensing exam. Next slide, please. So in addition to breadth of knowledge, they're also trying to define the depth of knowledge. So once we've identified topics that should be assessed, there's still a lot of work in terms of at what level of knowledge should the uh, newly licensed lawyer have. And we've approached this issue uh, with these guiding sort of um, criteria. We are looking at topics and putting them into um, buckets of what we call level one or level two. So level one are topics that uh, newly licensed lawyers should be able to spot the issues um, in a scenario and work efficiently with legal resources to 
perform their work. Um, the other level, level two, is where we think newly licensed lawyers should have more detailed knowledge of the doctrine without uh, consulting legal resources. Uh, so the factors that the uh, committee considered in deciding whether a topic is level one or level two include the complexity of that topic. Obviously, the more complex it is, the less likely a newly licensed lawyer maybe would need to know all of the relevant details of the doctrine in there um, in, without consulting legal resources. The context in which it typically arises. So if it comes up in a context frequently where the lawyer has the time and would normally consult with legal resources, versus it comes up in a context where the lawyer should know it cold and be able to, um, to move ahead uh, without the benefit of consulting legal resources. And then finally, are the legal rules and the rule components around that topic relatively stable and universal uh, so that it's fair that if it should be something that's classified as level two, um, that the, the ground on which the newly licensed lawyer or the candidates preparing for the exam um, have a stable um, a set of doctrine to learn. Uh, next slide, please. In uh, addition to looking at the FCPs or the knowledge domains, uh, the content scope committee has also been working on developing um, the test specs for the foundational skills we're going to be assessing. Um, so this, we have worked with the practice analysis task statements um, that were rated as being important. And we have categorized those task statements and looked at them under the categories of the foundational skills. And now the content scope committee has been working hard to define basically the construct that we're measuring. So we have, um, these illustrative tasks to help us with defining what specifically, um, for example, of this skill, the client counseling advising, what specifically should we be assessing about this skill on the new exam? That's been, um, I think, very interesting and exciting work for the content scope committee. And it's certainly an aspect of the new exam that, um, that we're very excited about as well as increasing the emphasis on skills. Next slide, please. In addition to this work of developing the blueprint or test content specs, um, the, uh, we've also been working with some experienced drafters and bringing in some new individuals to help with us work on what we're calling prototyping. So we are assessing knowledge and skills in a integrated design in the new exam, which is new for us to um, a new way of uh, assessing the content. We're assessing some new skills or we'll be assessing some new skills uh, that we're not currently assessing. And then the notion that I just covered with respect to the depth of knowledge. Um, so we've been thinking about those level one uh, topics where candidates are expected to have uh, familiarity with the with the topics um, and be able to work efficiently with legal resources. So we've been working on prototyping level one questions where the uh, relevant legal resources might be included or provided to the candidates in the exam materials. Um, and then thinking about the ways that those sorts of questions get framed um, as compared to um, questions that we currently draft and questions that I think are um, more reflective of practice. So framing questions in terms of what would be the next step you would take or what should you research next? Um, what's the relevant standard as opposed to what's the likely outcome or disposition of this matter? Um, and we um, do plan, as Judy said, to deliver the new exam on computer. So that opens up a lot of um, room for us to play and be a little bit uh, more innovative in the item types, including, uh, for example, that uh, with a paper and pencil, 
based exam, our um, MBE items, the Scantron sheet has four options. So <laughs> we can only have four options in a multiple choice question in the current exam. Um, computer delivery will allow us to have new types of selected response um, types of items and not have them limited to a four option uh, Scantron sheet uh, response pattern. Uh, next slide, please. So we are also working on our prototyping on the constructive response, um, the SA performance test uh, types of questions that will still be part of the new exam. Um, the MPT, as we heard in our testing task force uh, listening sessions, um, without any exception, I can tell you, because I sat through every one of those listening sessions, um, every single one, stakeholders expressed, keep the MPT. We like the MPT. Don't throw the MPT out. Um, so we have uh, listened closely um, to stakeholders from what we learned in the testing task force. There will still be MPT-like performance questions. They may change in some respects. They may be shorter rather than 90 minutes. Uh, we're looking at whether we can effectively have 60 minute uh, questions. Um, they might be presented as item sets, question sets. So you have a library, a scenario, um, and, and a case file and library of materials to work with, but you don't have just one assigned task. We might include uh, some short answer questions or um, potentially some selective response items within that. Um, so we will have the ability through our integrated design and the, um, the uh, approach of uh, adding item sets to uh, make these items look a little bit different, make them more realistic in terms of walking a candidate through uh, what they would really do in um, actual practice. And then they might include uh, billable forms for things such that an examinee is required to, um, as this indicates, complete uh, sections of a pleading or a contract. Uh, so it's not necessarily um, always a litigation oriented task um, and they're not now in the current MBT. So lots of fun work going on by our prototype uh, drafters in terms of developing or refining what um, is uh, certainly the most popular part of the current exam. Next slide, please. And our objectives, as Judy mentioned, and, and you can see on our timeline, uh, so we did just complete um, the content scope committee's work and we have, uh, it's well over 300 pages of <laughs> report materials, recommendations, um, great work that that group has done. Um, as Judy mentioned, um, we are um, looking at ensuring that the next blueprint, uh, sometimes there's, um, it's not clear, especially in common law areas or uh, areas of common law that we are testing, what exactly is the uh, authoritative source of law that candidates are expected to know um, in those areas that we're testing. So that's one aspect of their work is the content scope committee has been um, being sure to identify when it is not clear uh, what is the legal authority that we uh, would think candidates would be uh, expected to know and rely upon in responding to questions and showing their knowledge, um, in addition to the depth and breadth uh, of the scope of the content to be assessed that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we have just received that. We see additional um, development on the foundational skills aspect um, of this work. And that in particular, I think the two things go hand in hand as we're prototyping and trying out new ways of assessing things and trying um, ways of assessing new skills. We turn back to and refine the uh, test content specs. Um, so we have a little bit more work to do before we are in a position to uh, share these uh, test content specs, put them out for public comment and feedback. But we do uh, plan to get that done in the first uh, few months of 2022. 
And we will also begin pilot testing some of these um, items that we've been developing, the prototypes. Um, pilot testing will begin with uh, small groups of um, law students or pseudo examinees. We'll probably be trying to convene um, 30 to 40 examinees to uh, take the one or two hour set of um, prototype items um, so that we can get um, some data on how the items performed. We will get feedback from the examinees about what they thought about the items um, and really allow us to continue perfecting and determining you know, what item types and methods of assessment um, are, are most successful um, that we want to focus our uh, efforts on as we uh, start really building up this exam. Uh, so those are the main activities that will be starting um, fairly early in 2022, not January, but uh, I think we hope to be um, pilot testing um, and probably have the content specs out for public comment um, by April of this year. Pilot testing will go on um, you know, for a, a, a few months and we'll ratchet up from pilot testing with small samples of examinees of 30 to 40 examinees um, as we get more items. And we've gone through that sort of proof of concept. Yes, this new approach will work well. This way we will move into field testing where we will have larger samples of examinees taking more items, giving us more data and opportunities for assessing um, things that um, I think this is my last slide and I'm turning it over to Dr. McKinley to talk with you about fairness. And um, so this seems like a good segue into, um, into Danette's portion of the presentation. So I hand it off to her. Thanks, Kelly and Judy. I'm not gonna take too much time. Can we go to the next slide, please? I'd like to just talk about accepted practices to evaluate fairness and testing, provide some information about what NCBE currently does and talk to you a little bit about our planned research and how that relates to fairness. Next slide. On the previous slide, there was a book cover. It's the standards for educational and psychological testing. I'm pretty sure we've talked about this before, so I won't dwell on it for very long. But what I will say is that those standards are written for all sorts of um, examinations, including intelligence, achievement, and what they call employment and credentialing tests. And that's what we're going to be focusing on today, employment and credentialing. The important feature of this version of the standards is that it had a fairness chapter for various types of tests. But as I said, we're going to focus on what we do, which is credentialing. Next slide, please. I wanted to share this quote with the group to remind you of what we call the construct or the purpose of the exam. The goal is to ensure that newly licensed lawyers have shown that they have an adequate level of knowledge and skill to perform in their jobs as they enter the profession. And this is the way that the standards define that um, measurement of competency. They also note that these licensing requirements are also are often imposed by governments. So what we're doing is looking at what is needed by jurisdictions in order for newly graduated attorneys to enter practice. Next slide, please. Okay, um, you went back instead of forward. There we go, thank you. Um, the standards are divided into these four areas. I'm going to concentrate on the first three, test design, development, administration, and scoring, validity of test score interpretations, and accommodations. The last one we will get to, but probably not until after 2026, so I won't dwell on it today. Next. So as you've heard from various presenters before today's session and even during our session today, one of the first steps in developing any exam is defining the construct and aligning that with exam purpose. 
We do practice analyses and regular reviews of those practice analyses to ensure that the content on the exam remains current, that the scope and the depth as Kelly described is something that would be representative of the competencies needed of newly licensed attorneys. The other part of this is universal design. And I'm not gonna dwell on that very long either because universal design is such a large aspect of fairness. It's meant to ensure that the test materials are as accessible as possible before any additional accommodations need to be provided. So in designing these items, we wanna make sure that we're not introducing any barriers to examinees are not relevant to what they need to show to say that they're competent as newly licensed attorneys. One way to do this is through item review, and we do that with subject matter experts. Drafters draft the items. Those are reviewed by test editors who are also attorneys. They make edits to it, but then it's reviewed by a larger committee who has subject matter expertise in the doctrine that's being tested. We look for skills or knowledge that are not relevant to the task and try to make sure that we eliminate them. So one example might be that we make sure that the language that's provided is not overly obtuse or obscure or that the terminology that's used is language appropriate for attorneys and it's universally used. Finally, after those reviews, the items are put into a form and that entire form is reviewed one more time for context, for depth, for language and for clarity. After all of that, items are used in exams and regular statistical review of the items by total group and subgroup occurs. Um, when we look at it by subgroup, it's dif differential item functioning. We'll talk about that a little bit in the psychometric session, but the point is that we do everything that we can do to make sure that everything we've done then links back to the construct, that there's nothing in the test that's not related to our testing goal. Next slide, please. One of the, thing, one of the aspects that my colleague Mark Raymond will talk about is validity of test score interpretations. So we wanna make sure that what we're interpreting is that this has measured competencies. One way to approach this, and Mark will talk about this a little bit more, is to use think aloud protocol, not only of examinees with the items that we're prototyping now, but also with graders. So what we can do is to say, are the skills being measured that we think are being measured with this type of item? Is there some aspect of it that's providing a challenge that we didn't intend? That could be true also when graders are, are using scoring rubrics. We wanna make sure that they're interpreting the information that we provide in scoring guidance correctly and that they're applying it consistently. Again, we'll talk about item and test performance by subgroup as we field test the exam to ensure that we've removed barriers, as I said earlier, um, that are not relevant to the construct. Next slide, please. Accommodations is just another aspect of fairness um, that we we examine regularly. For all examinees, we need to make sure that there's no um, barrier to them demonstrating their knowledge and skill. One example of this might be considered um, testing format. When we do convert to computer-based testing, we're going to make sure that we are not introducing technological skills that would not be relevant to actual practice. So that's something that's going to be um, studied pretty, pretty thoroughly in the next exam. The other thing is that we want to make sure that there's equitable access to resources. So when we talked about um, reference libraries, for example, we need to ensure that we have a methodology that will allow our examinees to access any information that's needed that would help them to demonstrate their skills. And finally, we'll be co collecting evidence to support our conclusions about the accommodations that we provide, not only to uh, students that may need extra time, but also to those who are, are part of the regular testing. Next slide. And I'm turning it over to Mark Raymond. Thank you, Danette, and uh, good morning to everyone here. 
Um, so I'd like to take a few minutes to mention just a, a few of the psychometric and research and development efforts uh, behind our launch of the new bar exam. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll touch a little bit on pilot testing and field testing. Danette and Kelly have already talked about it. I'll sort of repackage that a little bit um, and talk uh, about some additional analyses that are involved. And then I'd like to move on to um, equating or score linking and um, how it's, that's gonna be managed and how it might be different for uh, the next gen exam. And then uh, finally wrap it up with a few comments about standard setting and uh, establishing, which refers to establishing cut scores, but as well as maintaining them over time. Uh, next slide. So as um, Kelly and Danette both mentioned, we plan to introduce some additional item formats that we haven't explored in the past. Uh, however, before anything makes it on to a live exam, we'll need to confirm that the items measure what we want them to measure, um, as Danette just uh, alluded to and uh, that they do measure those same skills for different groups of people. So we have established this sort of gauntlet of item tryouts uh, ranging from proof of concept at the start, um, then going on down to pilot testing. The next stage is what we're calling in our vocabulary uh, field testing. And then after that, we'll actually bring it all together and develop a prototype new exam form. So we've kind of got four different stages there. And as we go through those four stages, we um, move from uh, sort of qualitative to more quantitative procedures. We move from smaller sample sizes to larger sample sizes. Um, we move from relatively unrealistic test administration conditions. It might be a lab, it might be somebody's office to realistic conditions. Uh, um, and then we also move from looking at things sort of piecemeal and one at a time to seeing how all of the different items perform together on an integrated exam. So, so that's kind of how we move through these, through these four stages. And I'll mention, mention them again, proof of concept, pilot testing, field testing, and then finally prototype exam form. And that the importance of that prototype exam form cannot be overstated. It'll come up again under standard setting. And uh, through all of this, we'll be looking at the performance of different groups of people based on gender, race, type of education, and other factors. Uh, next slide, please. So one thing that we think will change in the future, we're not sure of this yet, is our method of linking and uh, equating. So as everyone knows, I think, um, we do what's currently called scaling to the MBE. So we use the MBE as sort of a solid anchor uh, to put performances on the MPT and the MEE all on the same scale so that we can achieve a goal of interchangeable scores across jurisdictions or what we re refer to as portability. Well, the, that method of scale and equating works very well. Um, it's robust to, to uh, certain vi violations of ideal conditions. Um, it really has served the profession well over the time, the years that we've been applying it. It may not hold up under what we're calling an integrated exam, where for example, um, item formats might vary uh, within an item set and where there might be item sets, for example, um, where performances, uh, whether it's a skill-based uh, performance or a content knowledge-based performance on a multiple choice question where those, differences, those different types of skills that are assessed are more integrated throughout the exam rather than being distinct components like they are now with the MBE and MEE. So that's gonna uh, re probably re require a different method of scaling and equating um, and sort of to the top of our, what's surfaced to the top of our list is something called mixed format equating, where you sort of put every item, whether it's an MPT type item or a short response item or a longer essay item or a multiple choice item, on the same scale, working up to the up to a single total score. So we'll end up with one total score at the end of the day, 
and indices showing how each individual test item, regardless of format, how it relates to that total score, which is a little different, quite different from what we do now where we can compute uh, an MBE score, an MPT score and an MEE score, treat them separately and then combine them at the end. It's sort of like mixed format equating requires that they get combined as you go along rather than waiting till the end to do that. And of course, we, we have currently have places and in, in, uh, procedures in place and will continue to have procedures in place uh, to monitor scale stability over time to ensure that scale drift isn't occurring or that if it does occur and it can occur with testing programs that we pick up on it early and correct for it. So in a nutshell, we anticipate our equating method or our linking method is going to change with next gen. We're just not sure yet exactly how it's going to change. We need to finalize our exam design and we need to do some more research into the viability of different equating methods. Uh, next slide. So standard setting is, you know, uh, performance standards and cut scores are set by individual jurisdictions. Um, and NCBE to date really uh, has not been um, involved in that process too much. We'll advise jurisdictions when requested uh, um, on standard setting procedures and so on and so forth and support efforts. Um, but we anticipate conducting a standard setting exercise, not to come up with a cut score, but perhaps to come up with a range of cut scores or some set of recommendations that jurisdictions can then use uh, to establish their own cut score. So um, in the future, we anticipate just as it is now that jurisdictions will continue to have authority um, over, their, uh, over the cut score that is set. However, we are going to be uh, more visible and overt in uh, working with jurisdictions to conduct a study to come up with a range of possible cut scores. Now we anticipate that our cut score study, standard setting study will incorporate uh, empirical data into it, um, which isn't absolutely necessary. So for example, we could build this prototype test form that I referred to a couple slides back. We could do a standard setting study before actually administering that test form. Now, when people set the standard on that exam, they wouldn't have any idea of how difficult the items really were. Um, and they wouldn't be, have an idea of where their, what impact their recommended standard would have on different, on the examinee population as a whole, as well as different groups of examinees. So what we anticipate doing is um, collecting data on this prototype exam form and perhaps using that as an opportunity to sort of integrate or interface with our standard setting study so that we're not sort of conducting standard setting uh, in the blind so that we have information available to know um, how, how difficult the items are going into it and what the impact will be of different standards um, uh, on a realistic subset of examinees. Uh, a key point of our standard setting methods uh, regardless of the particular cut score that is set is that it will be, and Judy alluded to this, it will be based on a compensatory decision model. That is strong performance in one content area could compensate for weaker performance in another content area. Strong performance in a particular skill domain could compensate for weaker performance in another skill domain. Um, the with an integrated test design, it really is a challenge to disintegrate those test items for purposes of setting multiple standards. So once you go down the path of accepting an integrated test design as your driving model, it pretty much locks you into a compensatory decision model. And that's really about all I've got to say. Um, and I'm happy to respond to questions later on. I think that concludes our, our presentation. If you have any questions, I, I, I defer to Justice Guerrero on how she'd like to proceed. 
I wanted to first thank you all for your very thorough presentations here today. It's very helpful to our group, and I would like to open it up and see if there are any questions that anyone has. And we'll just go in order. If you can raise your hand. Okay, I see Donna. Yeah, since I didn't see any other hands I uh, yet, I figured I could start it off. Um, so uh, actually I actually have a question for Kelly and a question for Mark, but I'm gonna start with Kelly. Um, so Kelly, I was really interested in um, sort of hearing your description because in my sort of simplistic view of what NCPE was doing, I kind of envisioned everything more like what you were talking about for the PT where there would be um, uh, where there would be, you know, scenarios described in the PT scenario with a with, you know, case file or, or statutes to look at. Um, and then maybe multiple choice questions thrown in there, maybe short answer questions, maybe, you know, uh, longer, longer parts of it. Um, I, I sort of envisioned that everything was going to be that way. But it sounds like from what you presented, there's going to be an essay type section and a uh, and that MPT type section, am I hearing you correctly? Um, there could be um, potentially standalone shorter essays um, or shorter essays. We've been kind of using the term moderate length constructed response items that um, could even be part of an item set um, or that could be part of a larger um, constructive response item. So um, the, as Mark mentioned, the test design is, um, is still in sort of a, a working draft state because we are prototyping. Um, it's sort of the whole chicken and egg and you know that you can only go so far with prototyping as you're waiting for your specs. We know um, enough to know some of the things that uh, are very likely to remain on the exam and focus that area in our in our prototyping um, early on here. But um, I don't mean to suggest that there's going to be an MBE, a section, or, you know, an essay exam and, a, and an MPT, uh, just that the performance test, um, the, the things that everyone likes about it, we want to make sure we don't throw those uh, that baby out with the bathwater, um, but we want to take what is already um, a really good uh, aspect of the exam and, and make it even better by not being constrained with sort of the, here's a, here's a performance task, <laughs> here's the next performance task. So I don't know if that answered your, the question um, about whatever ambiguity I introduced in my <laughs> remarks, so. Yeah, I, I, I think I think this I think the Blue Ribbon Commission is right sort of it, timing is an interesting problem right and trying to figure out if they're struggling with with is the is the next gen UBE the type of exam that we want to deliver in California or not and having sort of right now sort of less than full understanding of of how it's going to be constructed and what it's going to look like is 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 a difficult task for the commission as they're considering it. Um, and I can tell you trying to describe it <laughs> without, can't wait till we're labor, able to have some items that we um, have gotten through these early stages and are able to get some items out there so that you can see, feel, touch, read, interact with. Um, it is hard to sort of paint a picture of an exam um, without being able to, to have items to show. So sorry about that period of uh, sort of gray, gray yeah, it, it's It's certainly a timing, a timing issue. We understand that. One very quick question for Mark. Uh, Mark, you ended up saying that with a compensatory decision model, strong performance in one content area can make up for weaker performance in another content area. Strong performance in one skill area can make up for weaker performance in another. Based on the integrated nature of the test, it would seem to me that Maybe the unstated part of what you said is that strong performance in one content area can make up for weaker performance in a skill area, or no? Um, sure, I, I, I think that's the case. Um, although I, I sort of view 
uh, content and skills is sort of two separate things, two separate dimensions that, that any content area could assess a variety of skills ranging from simple reading comprehension through issue spotting, uh, through higher levels of problem solving. Um, but I, I think that's the case that poor performance on any group of items could be compensated for by strong performance on any other group of items. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you, Donna. I just wanted to follow up on the uh, reference to the timing issue, and you indicated that there was a possibility of releasing some additional information in April. I wasn't sure if that was the, the draft um, that, that you had mentioned, or the pilot testing, or both. It's going to be um, the draft of the test content specification, so the blueprint for what we're going to be assessing, what content and skills, knowledge and skills of these eight FCPs and seven foundational skills, more detail about what exactly are we testing within each of these um, subjects and skill areas, so the blueprint is um, what we will be publishing for public comment. Um, our goal is to have that out in April. The item prototypes, we're going to start pilot testing those, again, with the goal to start the pilot testing in April of 2022. As items um, move through that process um, of rounds of pilot testing, uh, we hope to be able to start to um, right. publish some of those as sample um, items that um, people will be able to see. We want to make sure the items, you know, do perform as we anticipate they're going to perform and, and do appear to be measuring what we think we're measuring with them before we put them out there as, as samples. Um, but we want to get that uh, at least first round of pilot testing um, input before we uh, publish uh, sample items. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you again, Donna, for your questions. And next we have Tracy. Good morning, and thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I loved the detail and the pattern of drilling down to entry level and defining the construct. That is something that often does not get the attention that it needs. So I really appreciated that detail. Um, I do have a few questions. Um, first of all, I, I'm curious as to the involvement of educators. Um, and are they actually involved in the item writing and seeing final drafts of that? I know that um, certain associations and various professions at the national level do use educators. Um, however, um, I'm with the Department of Consumer Affairs. We actually have a policy that we advise against using educators uh, for conflict of interest reasons. So we, we, we know sometimes that's easier said than done, um, but I'm just curious as to the involvement of the actual educators in seeing questions that they then are um, educating uh, students on. So that's my first question, please. Uh, and I don't know if Judy wants to respond to that um, or I, I'm happy to take a stab sure, at it. Sure, I can, that, that's a good question. I mean, our, our drafting committee members, I mean, how the drafting model might change on next gen, um, we're, we're working that out because we're gonna have to do a lot of item development in a short period of time. But we currently do work with some educators and we work with judges and practitioners and all of our drafters um, sign confidentiality forms and they're aware that, um, uh, you know, they, they have to have this, this wall between what they teach and, and the work that they do for the, the conference that it's under the highest confidential, confidentiality standards. And we have never had an issue with any of our drafters, but we, we have a diverse group, um, as I said, practitioners, judges, and some law faculty. Um, 
on the prototyping, and Kelly might want to talk a little bit about this, on some of the work that we're doing right now with prototyping, we are using um, a few current drafters, some of whom are law faculty and others who are practitioners. And uh, we'll continue to sort of see what, what development model works well for us as we go forward on the next gen uh, um, items as we know more about the content to be covered. I don't know, Kelly, if you want to weigh in on the, that. Yeah, I, I would add, um, we do find in particular, finding good drafters, you can have um, great practitioners, you can have a really knowledgeable, successful, uh, wonderful attorney who has great um, subject matter expertise, but just we are unable to really train them to assess what needs to be assessed. We find that legal educators who have to think about pedag pedagogy more and think about how to assess things um, while they may not have that connection to practice, they have this skill set that the practitioners sometimes don't. The marriage of those two, we have found, results in a really excellent way to go about drafting. So we bring, um, you know, the sort of science of education and assessment that the educators have and marry it to the practitioners. And that's been the case. And then we also find, even though when we say educators, some of those educators are true doctrinal faculty. Some might be even a, a dean or former dean, but we also rely heavily on clinical uh, faculty who are, you know, really uh, ed ed practitioners in an educational setting, um, and they are uh, particularly effective, I think, in the in the skills area and the performance test drafting. So. Thank you, that's very helpful. Um, my, my last sort of set of questions has to do with the standard setting process. Um, so if I'm understanding correctly, jurisdictions can set their own passing score, which um, is confusing to me as far as for ensuring portability. Usually we have a set passing score that represents entry level practice. Um, so when we see jurisdictions accept different passing scores, then that introduces some um, confusion into portability. Um, so then related to that, um, you indicate that the passing score or the cut score is set after the fact um, and may not be. So in the new form, again, I, I'm sorry, I missed that part of it. Um, we typically use standard setting information as we set the pass score prior to administration because of the pilot data. We do know the difficulty of the scores. And so we um, typically try to avoid any kind of um, adjustment after the fact. The standards do indicate that adjusting the passing score uh, can create problems for jurisdictions. So if you could clarify again, when you anticipate setting that passing score, and then again, the rationale for, or how that affects um, uh, transportability um, across jurisdictions if they then use different passing scores. Thank you. You know, it sounds like maybe there's a couple of components to this question. There's sort of a technical component related to how we maintain the standard over time once it's set. And I'd be happy to talk about that, but the portability, um, part of the question, I think I'll punt to Judy or Kelly. Um, I'm happy to take yeah. that, or, or I see, I thought Judy was muted, but um, uh, the queen of the UBE that I am here, <laughs> I will answer that one. Um, the jurisdictions accept the scores that are transferred in based on what their cut score is for people who test in their jurisdiction. So currently we have the uniform bar exam with portable scores across UBE jurisdictions all of which have the autonomy to set their own passing score. Um, so for example, Missouri has a passing score of 260 and um, say Illinois has 266. If I test in Illinois and I get a, a, a 265, I don't pass in Illinois, but I have a score that's passing in Missouri and I can apply to Missouri to accept that score. When I sat in Illinois and earned it there, but Missouri will take the score even though it doesn't 
hit Illinois cut score. So this is um, this is the way the UBE has um, has uh, been carried out so far is just still letting each jurisdiction have its autonomy to set its cut score where it wants. And I think to build on that a little bit that the, the technical component has to do with it's NCBE's responsibility. It is now and it will be in the future to make sure that a score of 265 or 235 or 285 means the same thing over time, even though the, the test form and the test content may change slightly over time. So our, our responsibility is to make sure that that score scale remains constant over time so that 265 continues to have the same meaning. Thank you, Thank Tracy. You. Thank you. Did you have any other questions? You were muted a little bit for a while. I just have one thing to add. I, I, I realize I can't post it on the screen. I was going to send you the link to the UBE website on um, portion of our website. The UBE is graded on a scale of one to 400. And out of 41 jurisdictions, I think two yet have not set their cut scores because they haven't actually started to administer the UBE. But out of the 39 that have, I think uh, something like um, 32 of them are between a 260 and a 270. So there actually is quite a bit of compression um, around uh, those about points between, like I said, 260 and 270, particularly 266 and 270 are the, the passing standards that most states have landed on. Thank you. Emily? Thank you all so much. This has been extremely helpful. I have a lot of questions, but I think I'm just gonna stick with one um, for now. And a lot of questions is really just kind of uh, information as, as it relates to the prototyping. But um, the one question that I would like to know now if possible is, has there been a consideration if you are going to be meeting with each jurisdiction and working with them on a standard setting process, is there a way for a jurisdiction to submit a piece of the exam to, the, to be added in in their jurisdiction? Meaning a portable <laughs> MPT, for example, that each jurisdiction could submit if they wanted to, especially if the standard, if the scaling is now going to be sort of mixed method, if, if, if we in California wanted to test family law in addition to everything the NCBE was doing, could we add in a additional question or is there a portion of the NCBE exam that could be interchangeable and that you would tell every jurisdiction you have one question you can add if you want to or something like that. I don't know if you've had that discussion and we've ruled that out. Um, or if that was sort of ruled out way back in the way back or what? So thank you. I, I'm not sure who of us, which of us wants to, to take that question. It's, it's a good one. Um, you know, it, it, there, there are certainly many states that are like California does right now, right? You have a portion of the exam that's NCBE and then you draft your own exam and there are other states that do that. And there are states that give the UBE and they don't give any portion of they don't they don't give a local component at the same time as the UBE. They do it they do a, a test later on, or they might do a CLE or something like that. Um, we haven't really talked about what you just asked with respect to this new test design. I think practically it might be really challenging from um, the publication standpoint and just grading. And as Mark said, if it is this sort of mixed item format equating, I'm not sure how that would work, but I think it's a question, you know, that, that it's, it's, I'm, I'm glad that you raised it and it's something for us to talk about, but we, we, we haven't done it outside of the way it's already done now where, you know, there's this component and then states add their, add their own, or there's this standalone local law test that is not part of the actual bar exam administration. And I don't know if, if Danette or Kelly or Mark wants to weigh in on that. I can only say with respect to the current UBE, the jurisdictions 
have by and large not had um, something that would be um, a, um, a, a test that meets the standards, let's put it that way. It, they are um, a bit more informal, um, but we have we did in the in the early days of the UBE, there was a jurisdiction that had a state specific essay component that they had candidates actually at the time of the exam take the, the additional state essays. They had a UBE score and in order to keep that state essay score out of the, the portable UBE score, they set basically a separate, it's like a separate hurdle or a separate passing uh, score requirement for that UBE jurisdiction specific component so that the score that's portable that is measuring not state specific law, but measuring what we've set out as blueprint and built our exam to, is based on our blueprint and that score um, is the portable part um, and the state specific part uh, score is not um, ported. Thank you. I'll, I'll defer to Mark on terms of <clears throat> how the standard setting aspects of that um, might um, work or the scaling um, uh, equating linking part. Yeah, I, I think it would be really challenging, I don't want to say impossible, to take responses to a, a local question and integrate that response into all of our item responses and then produce a total score for that jurisdiction. I think that would be very, very difficult to accomplish. However, we could certainly do something like Kelly mentioned, and I think that's been done where we produce a score. Here's the portable component you can add your piece to it, or, and you can do that by sort of keeping the portable component separate and then creating another score that's the combination of the two, or have that separate score have its own pass fail hurdle, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you. Did you have any additional questions, Emily? Not, not now, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Um, I saw Neil had his hand up, but I don't see him now. Yeah, no, I was gonna uh, ask the exact same question that Emily asked, so. Okay, thank you. Tracy? Uh, yes, I was just gonna add on that conversation that it could be um, an accessibility for candidates. So it, it could be a separate exam perhaps where, or anybody in the nation that says, oh, I wanna take California's exam. You know, I'm gonna take this, get a score on it, the next gen, but here's the California exam and I can take that, get a score on it and then go from there. So it could just be a, a way to utilize the process uh, of them scheduling and taking more than one exam. Just a thought. Thank you. Donna? Yeah, I, I think the reverse of Emily's question, um, and from, from what I'm hearing in prior conversations that, uh, that we've had, it's sounding more and more like there isn't going to be a part of the next gen exam that you can, that is equated, that you can pull off from the next gen exam, the way we do with the MBE now, right? Where California only uses the MBE and uses that as Mark talked about for, um, because that is, uh, we use that as the anchor for scoring the essay. So it's just, it, I just wanted, wanted clarity. It's sounding more and more like there really isn't going to be a, a component that can be, uh, a single component that can be used by, uh, by jurisdictions to, to serve that anchoring format. Anchoring purpose. Well, uh, Donna, you know, while we haven't really foreclosed anything yet, we are, I mean, I think it's fair to say we're operating under the assumption that the exam will be given as a whole rather than the parts where jurisdictions can sort of pick and choose which parts they might want to administer. So I think that's the assumption that's we're, that we're operating under. But as you've heard from Kelly, and from Mark and, and Danette, uh, we're working on test design right now. And we don't 
finally have we don't we don't have a final test design uh, right now. Um, um, but you know, once we know that, which we're going to have that in next year, um, you know, we'll certainly share that information with you. But I, I think that probably is our working assumption, and I don't know if. Kelly or Mark or Dennett wants to weigh in on that, but that's that would be my answer to that. I mean, we are designing, and then when we when we are actually building forms and and delivering this exam to be published and taken, um, you know, we're going to be building it to this set of our blueprint and the set of specs that to have the you know you're sampling the content um, that you are supposed to assess according to your blueprint and we're doing it especially in this integrated um, design it it seems like you know you, you you wouldn't necessarily be getting what you may think you're getting if you only take a piece of an integrated exam um, would be a, a, a concern you're you know it's hard to disintegrate something that is built by design to be um, a comprehensive measure that the whole exam sort of works together to come up with the compensatory score for your pass fail decision. But um, as Judy said, we're um, we're you know we're still building the plane here, <laughs> and it hasn't left the runway yet. Uh, so um, you know who knows? But um, that's where I say we kind of feel like we are at this point. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the multiple choice questions, and I understand you're in the really early stages, but there's been this criticism about that component of the exam that it tests rote memory, which isn't something that is really helpful for um, new newly admitted attorneys. Uh, you talked about a possibility of making them integrated and having some type of uh, different format with selected response items. Do you have a sense of what percentage or portion of the next gen would include these types of multiple choice questions? And do you believe that this sort of anticipated revised format would be responsive to concerns that have been raised about the multiple choice testing? Um, I, I do. Um... Given even the work, as I mentioned, um, separate and apart from what we're doing on prototyping and trying to um, uh, des develop our selective response items, they're going to—they're not going to necessarily look like MBE items. Um, but in particular, with our content scope committee, as I mentioned, that whole sort of depth of knowledge thing—that. Um, trying to really take a evidence based on practice of what newly licensed lawyers are doing um, and looking at each sort of topic within a, um, a subject and saying, you know, what is it that they need to have enough familiarity with the doctrine here to be able to spot the issues and do the research or perform the investigation or the interview, uh, work with legal resources. So their depth of knowledge is going to be not drilling deep, deep within um, every topic uh, <laughs> being treated the same under the, a subject matter, um, but then also trying to identify what are those um, areas of doctrine that they should know uh, without needing to rely on a legal resource. So we're, we're, that's been a very, very exciting part of the content scope committee's work that I think is addressing that um, complaint about the current exam that there's too much that they have to know and have in their heads to take this exam. We're drilling too deep into the areas that we're testing as what we heard from stakeholders. And then there's just too much breadth of what we're trying to assess. So we are very, very much um, focusing very precisely on um, basing it on what they're gonna be doing in practice. What should that depth and breadth be? Um, and then the skills area certainly is um, another, the, the 
um, members of the content scope committee, particularly the ones that are clinical professors are super excited about the development of what we're gonna be, you know, defining the constructs of what are we measuring in these foundational skills and then showing with the integrated design that, you know, um, teaching in the, the clinic work that they're doing, it's not separate from the knowledge that, that legal education and the bar exam because the practice of law is the, the knowledge and skills are happening together, <laughs> you know? So we're, um, I think those, those aspects of what we're doing, um, as well as the MBE items tend to be, um, they're all of a, of a similar uh, format, often a yes, yes, a yes because, yes because, no because, no because. And the uh, ultimate issue is sort of the, the disposition of the case or the matter. How would the court rule? What would the answer be to this? So sometimes just knowing which distractors are incorrect can require some depth of knowledge that <laughs> uh, make those items, um, I think, um, challenging. And we're looking at ways to have selected response items or multiple choice items that uh, won't be necessarily all of that sort of final, what's the final answer? How's the court gonna rule? How's this gonna be disposed? And to break it down and have those be more skill oriented. So here's a scenario and um, we're not asking you what's the right answer here uh, to this, the final right answer to this issue, but what would you research um, given this scenario and your client's uh, needs and wants? Um, what next steps would you take with this matter? So um, I think there's just gonna be a lot of change between the scope um, of what we're assessing as well as how we're going about assessing it. And it won't be limited to just the four options. So it may be, you know, here's a scenario and here is a list of eight uh, <laughs> options and you should pick the three uh, most relevant um, to, the, to the call of the question. Um, and so we're looking at a lot of different um, ways to have select response items that aren't just in the style of the MBE. Thank you, that's very helpful. Are there any additional questions? I don't see any additional hands. And so again, I wanted to thank you for the excellent presentations that each of you um, provided for us. They've been very informative and helpful to our group and we truly appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much you. for the opportunity. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. We'll go ahead and continue to the next item on the agenda, which is the review of CAPA, California's Attorney Practice Analysis. And we'll have a discussion regarding the knowledge, skills, and abilities that are recommended for testing and alignment with the NCBE's um, knowledge, skills, and abilities, or foundational skills, as they call them. We're going to um, be or present to present the topic are the following speakers, Dr. Henderson, um, who you all know. Uh, you, you know all of these speakers, uh, Ron P. and Dean, I never get your name right, so I'll say Emily, <laughs> Schiovaletta, and um, uh, welcome and thank you for presenting to our group on these topics. Yeah, thank you, Justice Guerrero, appreciate it. Um, I am Emily Scivoletto. Uh, I am going to share my screen in a moment. Uh, with apologies to Tracy, I am an educator. So <laughs> if, if you have any uh, worries about my conflict of interest, please let me know. Um, but I, uh, I'm with uh, Dr. Henderson and Ron P from the State Bar. Um, and we are going to certainly talk about, um, I think in a roundabout way, knowledge, skills, and abilities. But we're also, I, I hope that this can be a, a conversation. If you have uh, comments or, or questions throughout, please let us know. The, the slide presentation will be relatively short and then I think we can have a, a discussion. Um, I will start off uh, with uh, talk, sharing my screen and talking about just a re quick review of what CAPA is. Um, and 
then Dr. Henderson's also going to talk a little bit about uh, the methods that we used and um, we'll compare that with the NCBE. So I, I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully this works. Hopefully you can all see that. Okay, good. Um, so uh, and let me get to the point where I can actually move my screen here. Okay, um, so the CAPA is the California Attorney Practice Analysis. That's what CAPA stands for. Um, there was a working group that sort of was selected to oversee the process of serving the attorneys in California to try to determine what knowledge, abilities, and skills are necessary for entry-level lawyers again, with the purpose of um, determining whether or not what we are testing on our current California bar exam is appropriate for determining minimum competence um, when entering the profession. So um, we uh, basically were there to sort of oversee how we were going to survey uh, the attorneys um, and making sure essentially that the study um, aligned with um, the, uh, what we were trying to determine. Um, we uh, used two types of data collection, um, which uh, Dr. Henderson will speak more about, but we used a traditional survey method where it was really kind of, you know, how important, how frequent and how important or critical are these um, tasks. And then the experience sampling method was kind of an innovative way, and Ron P can actually give you much more information about this as well, but it was basically pinging um, attorneys three times a day to say, hey, what are you working on? And it was a great way to actually get real-time information. And so we use these two type of surveys, combine them together to get kind of a composite score that allowed us to determine what um, legal topics and legal skills, I'm using those terms, it's really the umbrella of a lot of other tasks, knowledges, skills, and abilities, but legal topics and legal skills are most appropriate to be tested for attorneys that, or for applicants that are seeking licensure. We then made recommendations um, as to the content of the bar exam, and I'll talk about a little bit more about why I've put content in all caps there. Um, and then in May 2020, we um, submitted our final report. So the Kappa working group, after reviewing the data that we received, and it was a lot of data, um, but we made three recommendations. The first recommendation is really that we adopt a construct statement. And a construct, and then the reason that this is important is that the construct statement is really defining what we're trying to measure that we're not trying to measure, is this attorney gonna be ethical? Is this attorney going to um, steal client funds? Is this attorney going to um, have all the knowledge in the world to stand in front of the Supreme Court, right? The, the idea is that the bar exam is measuring minimum competence for an entry level attorney. And so the construct statement that we worked on, um, you can see here, it's, it I'm sure could be improved. <laughs> um, I'm sure that there are other construct statements that are used. But this is what we worked with. And we recommended that this construct statement be used if we are going to have further studies, right? So if we're going to have an, another study about how we should be testing the bar, that this construct statement of what we should be measuring with the bar should be utilized. So that's what our first recommendation was. Our second recommendation um, after reviewing the data and recognizing just, I think, as the NCBE did, that we wanted to reduce the number of topics um, uh, tested on the bar exam or subjects um, was that we recommended that these eight legal topics be adopted for a new bar exam content outline. Um, and Essentially, the uh, civil procedure contracts, crim law, evidence, and torts were all, um, according to our studies and our composite score, really high up 
on both the experiential sampling and the traditional survey method. So that was sort of an easy way to say, yes, those five subjects we want to have in there. We called that sort of meeting our threshold composite score. Um, administrative law was actually one that also met that threshold composite score. And it was certainly not one that we have tested in the past, but because in California specifically, there is so much administrative law being done, this rose to the top in both of the um, surveys and uh, met our threshold score. Uh, constitutional law and property actually we as, have long, lengthy discussions about, about those topics because they did not actually meet our threshold composite score, but the committee talked about the fact that both of these areas are extremely foundational to our American system of law, common law, et cetera, um, that we felt that those would be really foundational concepts that an entry-level attorney should come out of law school um, or an apprenticeship knowing. Um, and then you'll see that, you know, professional responsibility, business associations, those were two that um, were, were ones that we talked about at length as well. And you can see professional responsibility, um, we felt obviously is vital. We, in our construct statement, we actually are talking about ethical representation, but the, um, we realize that PR is tested in a, in a few way, in a couple of ways. Well, it's, it's not tested, but it's required through the MPRE, through a course that is required. And then also um, the new attorney training program with the state bar requires four hours of CLE for first year attorneys. Um, so we decided not to include that in the eight subject areas tested, although certainly that, uh, I think ethical issues come into play in just about everything we do. Um, business associations and family law. Um, we also discussed those. Um, family law actually reached the threshold uh, composite score. Business associations did not, but we did decide that both of those are really specialized work and that might be better suited and re recommended that the bar take a look at whether or not it's a better idea to actually have a separate specialized exam or coursework or threshold other than the actual bar exam um, for practice in that area or specialization in that area. So those were the recommendations that we made for the, the topic areas. Um, our third recommendation was that the, the six competencies um, be tested um, uh, or be assessed by the bar exam. So essentially, the six skills that you see here um, and the CAPA report that is online actually goes into detail about what each of these mean. So when we say litigation, what are we talking about? When we say counsel and advice, what are we talking about? But all six of these areas met the threshold um, composite score number on both surveys that we, that we did. So I wanna mention just a couple of things, and we're going to talk about the difference between the NCBE and CAPA. So, so I mean, you all know this, but the NCBE really is um, looking at these things right now, right? The content, we just heard about it, the content, the structure and format, um, how often it will be offered, how it's delivered, the scoring, et cetera. Um, what CAPA looked at is one thing, <laughs> we looked at content. We had many discussions about structure, format, frequency, delivery mode, scoring, timing, all the things that of course we wanted to add into this conversation, but our charge was not that. Our charge was to oversee this survey process, this practice analysis, and to make recommendations related to content. So that's what we did. So were we to move forward, we would have a lot more conversation obviously about all of those other things. So I am going to turn this over to uh, Jim, who is going to talk about the method methodological differences in the surveys. Jim, are you are you there? I think now I um, am able to be heard. Right, <laughs> sorry. Um, 
So um, the uh, primary difference in the two projects, the Kappa project and the national one, uh, the, the differences methodologically were largely around the survey method. Survey uh, is required because the process for developing the outline of uh, areas of responsibility and competencies and subject areas um, uh, involves really a pretty small group of people as much as they were diverse along uh, critical dimensions of the population of attorneys in California and uh, for the NCBE nationally, uh, they are a small group and they can't be said to be representative of the population. So a survey is really essential. Um, in the Kappa study, um, the, we had a very different sampling experience than the um, NCBE did in that um, the uh, 190,000 licensed attorneys in Florida who could be considered eligible members of the population um, uh, were uh, uh, surveyed in large chunks. Um, and for the CAPA survey, uh, uh, 63,000 people were invited to complete the traditional linear survey um, and uh, 63,000 were uh, invited to participate in the experience sampling method survey. Um, for NCBE, um, uh, the organization solicited the cooperation of states ac across the country. Not all uh, were able to uh, participate by contributing uh, people to the sample. California gave that other third of its licensed group to NCBE and um, they uh, uh, used a matrix sampling survey. So overall, um, they had uh, just under 15,000 valid participants from the 30,000 that uh, first touched the survey. Because of the matrix sampling design, uh, what, what that means is that uh, every one of the 14,846 people responded to a small portion of the survey and then it split into four and they um, uh, responded only to the section that uh, of the one of the four sections that was presented to them. And so none of the 14,000 people, 15,000 people saw the entire survey. Uh, that's different from um, the uh, traditional survey where um, uh, if they stuck with it and many, 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 many did, um, then uh, they, they saw the entire outline system. So there were some differences. Um, uh, pick and choose uh, what you like methodologically. All three methods um, were sound and resulted in usable information. Um, so Emily, if uh, I want to uh, take back over, that would be great. Great. Thanks, Jim. So just to show you a comparison of the legal topics between what the NCBE is doing and what CAPA has recommended. Um, you can see straight across the board, they all match up pretty much except for business associations and administrative law. And then for skills, um, similar, uh, straight across the board, very similar in matching up. Um, except for negotiation and dispute resolution under the NCBE and litigation uh, under uh, the CAPA legal skills. Um, so just so you have a comparison um, on, on those general topics, as you drill down into each of them, there's probably some tasks, knowledge, knowledge skills, and abilities that are different in each of those settings, but overall um, they were 
very similar except for those areas. And Jim, you wanna talk about, um, well, I should say, if California is going to design its own exam, um, there are, as I said, we've only worked on what the possible recommendations for content could mean. So we would need to go through a number of steps. Jim's gonna talk about some, and then I will talk about a couple others uh, after. Go ahead, Jim. Perfect, thanks. So um, as Emily's pointed out, the uh, working group that was appointed by the Supreme Court to provide guidance for the practice analysis uh, did develop a construct, a construct statement. Um, that group uh, through the entire uh, uh, effort uh, spent a lot of energy talking about the stakeholders in the, in, in the uh, admission of attorneys to the bar in California. Um, it, but uh, if, if we are uh, going to, as a commission, endorse the idea that California should develop its own examination program, then the process of designing the test would likely be delegated to a group of, of some sort, and it's unlikely to be the same people in the uh, a uh, task group that worked on the Kappa study. There might be some overlap, but, but it's a different group. And so I believe that the best place to begin would be to analyze stakeholders in the licensure program, um, determine uh, what their interests are in the exam and uh, uh, document those things. And then uh, uh, understand the construct statement that the working group developed um, in light of those uh, uh, interests. Um, the practice analysis, um, as Emily uh, indicated, resulted in a set of um, competency areas and um, subject areas that uh, we believe are uh, most important to assess on the exam. Um, uh, and there's a, a lot of detail below that recommendation. So uh, that work um, has been recommended, but at this point, not decided uh, by the court. And so, you know, that would be an early next step in the design process. Um, I, it's also important to um, analyze who it is who would be taking the test. And uh, the, the value of doing that is first to understand their demographics and uh, the, uh, their general capabilities. How, how, what assumptions can we make about members of the candidate population about computer proficiency, for instance. Um, and what constraints do they experience? Perhaps in terms, some of those constraints might be economic. Some of those might have been educational opportunity, um, but to understand the, the abilities and constraints that uh, make up the, the group that would be taking the test. And then uh, uh, think about, um, and this seems early, I know, to think about score reports and reports to the schools and um, to the public about performance on the test. But um, you want to make sure that the information that you uh, would like to give to stakeholders about the performance of examinees and, and or you know give to candidates give to give to the law schools um, you want to make sure that that information uh, that you want to give can be supported through the design of the test so it's not too early to think about developing those reports and not necessarily in detail but but what it is you want to um, uh, uh, state about performance of the test and performance on the test. And then, um, and then also um, 
uh, the different elements of the construct statement um, have implications. And so what are, you know, what, while the um, uh, uh, construct statement works together with the findings from the Kappa study to identify content areas uh, for the test. Um, the, the no weighting structure has been uh, defined at this point. So, you know, how much emphasis should be given to research as opposed to strategy formulation? Um, how much emphasis should be given to administrative law as opposed to um, any of the other um, uh, areas of, of law. Um, so uh, based on the construct statement, um, it developed you know, a set of content specifications for the test and identify what item types and what testing formats allow you to satisfy the requirements of the construct statement uh, most effectively, um, including in that um, uh, considerations such as uh, how you're going to conduct, how you're going to analyze the performance of the different items or questions or problems that make up the test and what reliability computations um, you would want to make and make sure that the uh, design of the test gives you the information that you need to be able to compute those statistics. Um, also, it's really important to field test. And I would say it's really important in California to um, uh, develop a robust field testing plan, because that's an opportunity once you've made some headway in developing prototype items to uh, collect data about um, how, uh, how well aligned they are to the abilities of the target audience and, the, um, uh, and their makeup and to make sure that we're being fair in every respect. So um, designing a field testing plan that allows, for instance, for us to conduct diff studies, differential item function studies to make sure that uh, we're not um, uh, disadvantaging a population of uh, candidates or subpopulation of candidates along any ethnic or um, uh, racial line um, or, or any other uh, pertinent um, difference in, in the candidate group. But, but in addition to that, and perhaps just as important, as, and it is just as important as that, do the items that you've identified as effective measures of the construct in fact give you the information that uh, we, we want? Uh, and what modifications do we need to make in the item format um, that would um, uh, improve the uh, quality of inferences that uh, we would make based on the items and the information that they give in the Jim? test? I, Jim, um, I was going to say in, in your, um, in this next slide, um, the one that uh, follows this, there's a, uh, you do uh, this uh, comparison between the NCPE and the California bar exam on some of these same issues. Um, can we get um, to that slide? Um, because, you know, we want to be able to spare some time at the end and also highlight, you know, that um, it, where we're at in terms of design now. Uh, the next steps for that exam. It, it, do, do you mind if we advance? Totally to fine. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jim. So, and Jim, feel free to join me here. So that the next steps um, for NCBE versus uh, Kappa or California, I should say, the California bar exam. Um, the NCBE, as you just heard this morning, um, the content has been determined. They've done that. That's it. They're done. Uh, the scope of the content, however, uh, breadth and depth of content, they're still working on. Um, there is a committee process. Um, the structure of the exam, um, we heard a lot about this morning, um, that is they're prototyping, they've got mixed item types and formats, the MPT will continue. Um, 
modified, it sounds like modified multiple choice. Um, frequency of the exam they have determined will be twice a year. Um, the delivery mode of the exam will be a computer-based exam, not handwritten. Um, and test centers will be used or managed sites. So if the jurisdiction wants to, we still wanna have a big warehouse of folks, we can still do that. Um, the timing of the uh, exam, uh, well, the timing for the exam is a single event exam that will be, I think Judy had said after graduation, but I know some jurisdictions actually do it before graduation. Um, and then the scoring of the exam is compensatory, meaning that you can, one part of the exam you can, if you don't do well on, you can make up for it in another, will arrive then with one single score. Um, so we will not be able to, as we've had the discussion this morning, be able to, to just piecemeal uh, the NBC, NCBE portion of the exam. Uh, for the California bar exam, we don't know. <laughs> uh, we have the content that has been recommended by CAPA. Um, we will need to have a scope of content committee or discussion. I will say that the, um, I think the study that we've already done and the practice analysis can really assist with this because I think that Jim and Ron P can really break down the uh, a lot of the information um, it, that we received that that's below sort of this top level uh, topic line. Um, the structure of the exam, um, we've had some discussions amongst this commission. And so I just sort of listed these here. We've, we've discussed having less reliance on multiple choice exams, more reliance on PT type questions, more heavily testing skills, um, and actually having a discussion of open book exams or having uh, the actual law be provided to candidates when they are testing in some areas, maybe not all. Um, frequency, delivery, and timing. Questions to just think about for if we have a California exam. Do we want to be able to offer a bar exam more than twice a year? NCBE will, will not be doing that. Do we want test centers or a setup site? Um, do we want one sitting or multiple? Meaning, could you take half the bar exam in July, you've passed that, and then you get to take the other half in February because you didn't pass it in July. So you only have to take a portion of the exam. Do we want that? Um, scoring of the exam, single score. Uh, could a California exam have the same scale as the NCBE? Could we use the same scale that they're using and negotiate with states to have our score be portable? These are things to think about. Compensatory or standalone scoring for sections. So this is our last slide. Jim, and I know Ron, you're on here too. Anything else anybody wants to add there? No, I don't have anything to add, Emily, thank you. All right, well, I will stop there and I can either stop share or leave this up if this is helpful, but uh, happy to take questions or comments or discussion. And I'll just turn it back to Justice Carrera to do that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you all for the presentation. Yeah, you answered the question that I had about the timing, which was unknown at this point. Are there other questions from the group? Jeremy? Hi, Justice Guerrero. Thank you, Hi. everybody, for that uh, presentation. Um, just a quick question. I'm kind of curious, like, what other industries do if we know, uh, like, like, in terms of doctors, um, when they sort of take their medical exams, are they offered multiple times? Are you allowed to take uh, one portion during the year and another portion during another part of the year? Uh, they count sort of passing one portion and then you have to take the unpassed portion. Just kind of curious like what other uh, professional industries are, uh, do in this regard, if we know. I think we're gonna talk about that today. Amy, sorry, I don't know if that was directed at, at us or to Justice Guerrero and Amy. Uh, we're talking about that in the um, non-exam pathway, um, the, the idea of residencies, but in terms of the examination, 
Um, this is something that we could definitely bring back. Um, we don't have information on that at the moment. Um, I thought maybe Tracy could, um, uh, uh, has some DCA uh, uh, exams related to the medical industry. Tracy, do you have some information about um, how the medical profession provides exams, like um, whether it's the comp compensatory uh, grading model or having the exams at multiple times of the year? in the medical field? I do, but I have to refresh myself on the notes. They have multiple steps and the exams are taken at different times. Um, and it is more about like, you have to have a passing score on each exam. Um, they used to have like a hands-on clinical. They've actually discontinued that. So they're doing some changing right now in response to COVID, uh, but they do have exams that must be passed. Again, they're staggered though, depending upon where they are in their residency and their schooling and the test is designed for what skill or knowledge level that they have achieved at that point in time. So, and I'll just approve this and circle back later on um, with the specific exams that they have. Um, most of our programs do have um, an exam. Uh, obviously, they have multiple hurdles where, uh, I call them hurdles, uh, where there might be education, some kind of experience and then an exam. Some have supervised experience. Um, some just have exams, but most of them uh, have multiple uh, pieces that must be achieved to get licensed. Um, and we really encourage our programs to offer the exams more often. Um, that's an accessibility issue. So many of our professions that we regulate have computer-based tests um, that are offered quarterly. Many of them offer daily. Um, our psychologists, our, our counselors, therapists, and so forth, um, it's daily uh, in which you can go take your computer-based test, get your score walk out so you can practice. So that's really an important thing uh, for contributing to the economy and uh, our individuals being able to practice. One quick clarification uh, got everyone's attention. Emily, um, we, we fully support having educators involved in the practice analysis part, um, very valuable. Um, and, and we love to have them involved and we will utilize them as we can in the exam validation process. We just prefer to keep them actually out of the exam development. And as I said, same thing with board members. Unfortunately, not recently, but in the past, we've had problems with board members, licensees, and uh, others who have been exposed to the test actually go out and sell questions and things like that. So even though they sign confidentiality agreements, we have had uh, problems with security. Again, in the past, we've tightened things up, but, but I do want to, again, um, clarify that educators are important in exam validation. We do value them and use them at DCA. We just keep them out of the actual exam uh, development portion. Thank you. Thanks, Tracy. I'm sorry. Bye. It keyed in on that too much. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Tracy. Um, Jeremy, also, I uh, just learned that also doctor, uh, doctor's exams happen throughout medical school and then once more at the end of um, the uh, education sessions. Okay, thank you. Very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Natalie? Hi, everyone. Um, though not maybe directly related to what's been presented so far, one of the um, questions that I have as we consider whether we should adopt the NCBE's next gen or create our own bar exam is what would we make available to test takers? So if we were to adopt the NCBE's exam, we would be limited to whatever they're willing to share with test takers and as has been the case. Had, did Kappa at all talk about that in their discussions that moving away from a UBE exam and having a California exam would allow us the opportunity to decide what, if anything, would be helpful to provide test takers as they prepare for the exam. By that, I mean like, you know, 
is it was was there deficiency specific to skills was it just was it specific to subject area and if it was subject area was it one subject versus the other uh, that kind of information so natalie the quick answer is is not officially um we had conversations and you know we've had conversations about this for several years about you know if we are able to redesign and 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 um change the bar exam to a, a bar exam that is that has different components to it how does that how do we help test takers prep for that right I and mean, certainly rather than going and paying a commercial prep system is it possible for us to have that be something that law schools can provide and and actually um that's all that's needed if that makes sense um, but we haven't really had those um discussions as it relates to um the content um i think the i some of the idea was that and i think the ncbe would say this too that that relying less on memory and more on the skills that one has developed over time through either law school or the apprentice program um, is really what we wanna be testing. And so I think the idea when we were thinking of shrinking the topics, for example, was that this would allow us to, um, you know, uh, make sure that, that we're not, that we're able to test more skills that would hopefully be somewhat innate rather than um, uh, memorized legal topics. But other than that, we did not really get to a question of how would we work this with test takers. Um, just correlated to that, one of the things that we also talked about was the opportunities for us to evolve our exam in a way that might be more helpful for California than other states or, or not, but just in a way that might not take a national lens, but a state specific lens like cultural competencies, for example. If that was something that we felt was something that should be tested as to whether or not an entry level attorney would have the competencies necessary to deal with multi, a multicultural society, again, how you test that, I don't know. But having that type of a uh, portion of the exam would be, if we decided to do that, would be flexible um, so we had those types of discussions um, a little bit about what if we want to, but not really what if we want to make sure that the the, the examinees have good testing material and so. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Are there additional questions? Sorry, Justice, that's a new hand if, if I'm able to ask another question. Oh, yes, of course. Okay. Um, so flexibility is something that I find very uh, appealing. Um, but one of the other issues that we've heard a lot about is then portability. And this is the, the first time that I've, I've heard in our discussions the idea of somehow still maintaining a California specific portion, but allowing for negotiation between jurisdictions. And so for those that are staff members here present today, can you talk a little bit about how would that look if we were to go the UBE route um, while still wanting to maintain a California specific portion of the exam? Is that something that you think could happen that we could still negotiate portability that works both ways with other jurisdictions? This is something that um, we would need to pursue on a jurisdiction by jurisdiction basis. Um, there's some jurisdictions, oh, overall, uh, schools that um, are not ABA uh, accredited um, are not um, accepted in other states. Um, the last time we conducted this level of analysis was like in the 1990s. So I think reaching out to the schools about that, uh, to other jurisdictions about the potential to accept um, all of our uh, California graduates, despite um, their uh, uh, you know, educational attainment in order to qualify to sit for the bar exam would be uh, something that we need to reach out and do individually with each of the jurisdictions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you both. Leah. 
Yeah, just to follow up on that, um, irrespective of whether or not we went to the UBE, we could reopen the conversation about portability. Um, and that obviously I think is driven, would be driven, you know, can jump in, but by the Supreme Court. But my understanding and view is if we were willing to accept um, other sports, uh, other states' uh, tests, then then conceivably we have a bargaining at chip there. And one of the other issues around portability has been our non-ABA schools, our California accredited, our registered schools, and those not being recognized in other states. And if we were willing to be flexible there, we may see more avenues opening up for uh, portability. So just wanna make clear, I don't think portability is uh, contingent on the UBE. And also just to follow up on some of the, um, issues Emily raised, I think she's done a great job of kind of highlighting all of the various um, ways that we would lose flexibility going with the UBE, but I just wanted to emphasize some of the things I've thought about as well, which is the um, remote versus in-person exam uh, administration, the ability to test or implement open book exam, um, the, certainly Emily raised the, the question of cultural competency as part of the exam. I do know they added that to the MCAT, the entrance exam for medical school some years ago. So that is certainly something we might wanna consider. So I just think there are many different facets to what, what you lose when you go with the UBE. You obviously gain something, um, but I wanna make sure we're, we're clear on sort of all of the different things that you lose the ability to innovate around. So thanks. Thank you. I don't see any additional hands. So thank you again to the presenters. And we'll move ahead to the next item on the agenda. And that is a panel discussion of differential performance based on various question types, exam modality, administration settings and closed book versus open book options. And we will be joined by the following three speakers, which I would like to welcome and thank for joining us here today. Dr. Chad Bookendahl, who's a partner with ACS Ventures. Dr. Joy Matthews Lopez, president and senior psychometrician with JML Measurement and Testing Services and John Weiner, Chief Science Officer with PSI. I believe they're all here with us now and I'll turn it over to them, thank you. Thank you very much. I think I'm first on the agenda. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, great. Thank you all so much. Um, thank you for the invitation to present some information. Uh, I'm John Weiner. I'm the Chief Science Officer at PSI. I'll just introduce myself real quickly, just for context. Um, so as Chief Science Officer, I lead uh, teams of psychometricians and test developers who create uh, and uh, content for a wide range of licensure and certification exams, um, either for states or for global applications. Uh, some of my experience, which will be relevant today, also pertains to the world of employment testing, uh, where many of the same issues uh, that we're going to discuss have been addressed. So that's the lens I'm uh, speaking through today, um, and one where I've, my, my early background is in psychometrics and measurement, but I've, I've uh, evolved into other aspects of assessment too, leading, leading various teams. But um, so what I'm going to focus on, uh, my understanding is that there was an interest in really the issue of um, fairness in testing. And uh, spe specifically, uh, I was asked the question about question types and how those impact uh, test fairness and potential um, differences in candidate performance. And uh, I'll just say that you know, this is a, a lightning rod issue uh, in, in testing, not just limited to this one area, but, um, but one that's very important. And so when I, when I was thinking about fairness, I, I had to start with, um, well, what, consider the source, you know, why, why are we even asking the question? And it gets into, it begins with um, 
what I would say is the focus on cognitive ability testing, cognitive loaded tests. So if we go to the next slide, please, I'll, I'll explain why I have this slide here. Uh, uh, really, when, when groups perform differently on an assessment, uh, that typically raises the question, is, is the test fair? Or uh, that's one of the, you know, there are many definitions of fairness, of course, but it does start the conversation. And uh, for context purposes, uh, that's where I want to start. And then I'll talk about uh, strategies. But I think it's important to begin by saying, well, uh, acknowledging that cognitive tests, measures of uh, knowledge, skills, and abilities um, tend that are cognitively loaded have manifested differences for decades. You know, this, this is not a new uh, issue, of course, and uh, so and they're well documented. So, in educational testing and employment testing, uh, th there's been a lot uh, written and published. Um, and we see differences, uh, especially uh, with uh, racial and ethnic groups uh, in particular on cognitively loaded tests. And uh, I'm not picking on the SAT, I just picked that as one example, but in, as an educational uh, test for college entrance, you know, there's some well-documented um, differences that range from, um, you know, a, a fourth of a standard deviation, four tenths rather, to uh, a full standard deviation, which is very material uh, in, in terms of differences. So, uh, and, and we'd see the same trend in employment testing. Uh, yeah, so you know, before and after the bar exam, the, these same trends are, are, are there. Now, I'm not calling out cognitive ability as something that, um, you know, we're not saying change that because if, if there's a practice analysis that says, uh, you know, knowledge, certain knowledge areas are important, you know, and certain competencies like investigating or uh, so forth are important, then those should be measured. But um, we'll talk in a moment about maybe how to address them. But my point here is just that, you know, this is a longstanding um, concern. And so for decades, there's been a discussion about this and, and I, I think improvements along the way. Um, I did take a quick look at the, um, recent report for the uh, bar exam uh, 2018 data, and I looked for similar data. And uh, the, there are subgroup differences. Uh, the way they're reported there are minority versus uh, non-minority. And they tend to be lower than what we're seeing in these other areas, which, um, which is interesting, maybe 3, uh, 0.3 to 0.4 standard deviation difference, which is, it's still material, and depending where, you know, we can't ignore, you know, where's the cut score set. So that depends, the, the implications of that difference really depend on where the passing score is and the passing rates. And we can talk more about that. But I wanted to start here with cognitive abil uh, cognitively, cognitively loaded tests, because I think this is one of the key sources of differences and one that maybe raises the question. And, um, and this sort of longstanding quest that I think has been in place for what are alternatives. So I'll, I'll go to the next slide, please. And so uh, when it comes to uh, alternative methods uh, for testing, there are a number of um, approaches that have been examined you know, over, you know, over the years. And I've sort of summarized them here into eight categories. Um, it's sort of in order of how helpful they are in terms of addressing uh, subgroup differences, uh, drawing from the literature, uh, research published research literature, uh, as well as uh, I think a lot of this corresponds with my own experience uh, in, with various programs. And um, certainly the one about assessment methods, which I think was my original question to address. I'll, get, I'll, de I'll dig more into that in the next slide, but, um, but I, I think it's, it, so when someone, I think if the question is, are there certain methods that can be addressed or, or used to, um, I guess, improve the situation with regard to group differences that might manifest, uh, the answer starts with, well, what are we measuring? You know, and the cognitive loading is important. So uh, one thing that, that jumps to the top of the list or near the top is um, measuring more than just uh, cognitive cognitively loaded KSAs uh, in an assessment. So including non-cognitive competencies 
turns out to be a rather effective method for um, uh, reducing differences that manifest on scores. So I'll, just, I'll say that much. And I'm, I'm gonna spin through it quickly because I think the plan is we're gonna take about uh, maybe 10 minutes each. And then, uh, then we have plenty of time for questions after that. Uh, the next area that also has um, pretty material impact uh, in terms of its effect on, on group differences is how if a test has multiple components um, and uh, how those are weighted, the weighting of components does make, can make a difference, as well as in multi-stage testing, the order and um, the order of those assessments can make a difference. Um, and then obviously how standards are set, passing scores and so forth makes a difference um, in that area. Now, in terms of assessment methods, I'll dig into that a little bit more in a moment, but that's where I'm gonna talk about uh, methods, meaning other than M multiple choice questions, traditional MCQs and, I'll, and, and modes I'll talk about on the next slide too, because I they sort of interrelate. So modes meaning other than purely text-based, pure text-based questions. Uh, other areas that, that I've seen um, and we may hear more about, I think we're gonna hear more about that even, I'm not sure, uh, from the um, from folks on the, uh, from the California Bar, but um, on removing biased item content. So typically what that might mean would be really two things. One is, sort of a cultural sensitivity review of content, which is very important. And also um, an analysis of potential bias in test questions. So people use the term diff, differential item functioning, diff analysis. Um, those are important to do. They tend not to have much of an impact on, you know, to those traditional methods tend not to have much impact in terms of the actual, you know, passing rates or scores or differences between the groups. So. While it's important to do, it's not. It's, it tends to be less helpful. The same with, um, you know, there have been uh, attempts to adjust the instructions and make sure, you know, and how assessments are contextualized to people taking tests. That can have some impact. You know, some you know the issues get mentioned, such as uh, around test anxiety or stereotype threat around testing. Those are those are concepts that are. Uh, there are some who advocate that, but there's not real clear evidence that that's really working well. Um, providing practice and coaching on tests does tend to help. Um, and it's, it, it appears lower on this list because uh, if you're just looking at test score differences, uh, it, it, it's not that helpful in, in um, changing the differences between scores because uh, as the saying goes, a right, you know, rising tide raises all boats. So it's a situation where everyone's scores increase. But, but if, it, if we're using a test in a pass-fail context, it can help passing rates for groups that tend to maybe have lower pass rates. So practice and coaching is, is pretty important. Uh, and then lastly, real quickly, modifying the time given to take a test, uh, giving more time or unlimited time hasn't uh, shown to be that helpful. Um, it, okay, uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, very quickly, um, this was sort of the key question I was asked, <laughs> so I'm going to focus on this. Um, there are there is evidence that the use of alternatives to uh, traditional multiple choice questions uh, is helpful, but the punchline there is that that's usually helpful in reducing subgroup differences to the extent that that those assessments typically measure more than just cognitive skills and abilities. So they, they tend to be more multifaceted. But situational judgment, scenario-based questions tend to be, uh, tend to um, manifest fewer different, you know, lower differences, decreased differences. Same with uh, oral structured interview type assessments and performance-based assessments uh, typically are, uh, improve uh, the situation when it comes to subgroup differences. Um, and then some very specific uh, approaches that I, I, I think do have an impact, you know, these are pretty kind of tactical things that can be done are to make sure that, you know, and I think this came up, I, I, I'm glad I was here for the earlier presentation uh, and discussion. Um, 
uh, and looking at uh, the making sure that what we're measuring uh, is not that the assessment is focused at the right level of cognitive complexity. It's not introducing something different that impacts people's scores. So for me, if, if the idea is to measure knowledge, uh, that is not being conflated with reasoning. Uh, or if, if the purpose is to measure um, someone's ability to evaluate and make a decision of using knowledge to do that, that's, then it should be called out. It should be used that way, but not unintentionally um, creating more complexity than is needed. Um, same with language, you know, reading level and language uh, is important to focus on, make sure that is targeted at the right level. Uh, use of, um, of images or multimedia, sound, uh, animation, video, as an alternative to purely text-based assessment has shown to reduce differences. And then lastly, um, I mentioned coaching and practice. So I'm going to stop there quickly. Um, I know we'll have questions at the end uh, on all this. So I'm going to uh, end my slides here, and then uh, I think Chad would go next. So we can skip the next two. Thank you. Thanks, and you can go to the next slide. So as John mentioned, um, in talking about some of the different, um, both kind of item or question types, as well as strategies to try to promote fairness and reduce uh, potential systematic bias, in the, in the exams, um, one of the things that, um, that we were talking about here with respect to then how are those items or questions put together? And I think as um, Judy and Mark and Kelly um, uh, from NCBE talked about earlier, some of the different strategies to try to measure um, applicants for the bar, uh, that's something that, you know, you definitely want to try to reduce any systematic differences. Um, in thinking about examinations themselves and particularly licensure examinations, we can trace some of the origins back around about 4,000 years ago to the, to the Chinese civil service exam program in which um, applicants for roles in government positions would uh, have to independently demonstrate uh, the sorts of knowledge and skills and performance tasks associated with the roles for which that they were for the roles that they were applying. And it's, um, uh, it's interesting how some of those kind of core characteristics um, really do kind of connect to um, uh, connect to some of the, uh, the thoughts around content validity that we still have today of ensuring that content and cognitive complexity and the performance or the environment in which we're doing the measurement um, should represent the job for which we're asking people to then demonstrate those tasks. And well, why did licensure examinations kind of come into being? Well, there was a lot of variability in people who were claiming to be able to, uh, to offer or provide the sorts of um, expertise or services associated with a profession. And um, because of that, many professions, hundreds of professions are now regulated through the licensure process for public protection. And so that, that role continues to, to be why um, psychometricians in particular want to ensure that when we are constructing measures, that they are representative of practice, doing so in a way as John described, um, meet those, those kind of technical properties and characteristics, but, but are also doing so in a way that are not introducing things that are unrelated to the job so as to then disadvantage uh, people who didn't have the same sorts of um, um, opportunities or educational experiences um, that would have otherwise uh, suggested that they were qualified. And so um, if you advance to the next slide, how we put these together, then when we think about a testing modality, as I've mentioned, um, tests themselves have different purposes. And the sort of validity argument or, or um, evidence that we have for these um, is related to that purpose. We think about education being connected to an alignment of uh, kind of curriculum and instructional expectations. That is different from certification where somebody um, 
uh, sort of a true certification is a voluntary activity and you're seeking minimal qualifications or minimum competency. Um, now, of course, we have instances uh, in a number of professions like physician assistants or occupational therapy, for example, that they are um, characterized as certification, but if you need the credential to practice, it becomes a de facto license in, in terms of how it um, uh, presents itself. And then of course we have licensure, which is mandatory minimal qualification, um, looking at minimal, minimal qualifications, and essentially with licensure, uh, just as a lot of certification programs, um, there are multiple steps in the process. There's an eligibility component that may include education and or experience, as well as an independent demonstration of competency, and then some sort of ongoing uh, maintenance of that competency through continuing legal education in the case of the, of, uh, of, uh, the legal profession or continuing education or other, other sorts of demonstrations. That then is distinguished from employment in which we are making then more rank order decisions around hiring or promotion or retention. And I mentioned that because um, not all testing modalities are appropriate and they should align with the purpose of the test that you're trying to offer. And so on the next slide, um, what we try to highlight are some of the uh, characteristics of uh, the different modalities that are offered. And so uh, please advance to the next slide. Thanks. So common modalities for licensure and professional certification are going to be things like linear fixed form, meaning um, the exam is offered, that the same exam is offered to every applicant or candidate in which um, the same number of questions uh, and, and there's, there's not interchangeability or mixing and matching of questions that, as was kind of asked, I think, by, by folks um, from the previous section. Um, there's also this idea of linear on the fly testing in which a, an item bank, uh, um, an item bank is used to then dynamically construct forms of the test that meet content specifications as well as empirical specifications to ensure that the ease or the difficulty of the test is comparable from applicant to applicant. And so that it's something that helps to promote security, um, sampling of this larger kind of domain of interest that you'd be interested in, but also um, that you're doing so in a way that you are not, again, advantaging or disadvantaging somebody by the kind of, kind of the combination of questions they get. Um, that is different from computer adaptive testing. So linear on the fly means that people still take um, generally the same number of questions, uh, but they just aren't the same questions. There's more, but it's not a customization the way that computer adaptive testing is in which the next question you get is influenced by how you have answered previous questions on the test. It's often done, um, for example, the, the NCLEX exam, the nursing licensure program, does this. They use a combination of content representation and um, so minimum numbers of content, but they're also trying to be as efficient as possible in getting to a decision about pass or fail. The other um, common sort of modality for testing is using performance tasks, whether they are authentic uh, crane operators, for example, uh, have a performance exam in which they demonstrate authentically using different types of cranes, depending on the credential they're seeking, and actually performing the sorts of tasks they might do on the job, versus a simulation. So a simulation could be something that is computer-based. You could use a dentist for performance exams, for example, use artificial teeth um, as opposed to um, uh, patients for certain types of procedures that may be more invasive for which you may not find volunteers to, to jump in to get a root canal, for example. Um, other types of simulation that are becoming somewhat common in the education space may include gamification sorts of simulations. Gamification within the licensure and certification space may, may sound or feel more trite unless the demonstration or the simulation is uh, clearly job related in terms of the tasks that people are being asked to perform, as well as the same sorts of content and cognitive complexity that they might be expected to demonstrate on the job. And then um, in the medical profession in particular, they have something called OSCEs, Objective Structured Clinical Exams, 
that are oftentimes station-based and may include a combination of um, written, um, there could be patient interaction, um, there could be other sorts of kind of uh, psychomotor demonstrations of a particular skill. Um, those performance tasks in particular link back to what I mentioned earlier about those Chinese civil service exams. A lot of those skills um, that were demonstrated come through the performance tasks. And with, within the bar exam, the PT questions in particular are performance tasks, but even the, the essay questions that are involved are a constructed response or the candidate or the applicant creating something that responds to a prompt or a task. The, the key with any of these though is they should align to the breadth and depth of the measurement that connects to job related practice. And so the, the, the effort that California has gone to through that CAPA project to evaluate what are the knowledge, skills, abilities, and other characteristics of entry level um, practitioners or newly licensed lawyers, um, similar to the effort that NCBE did in their national study um, of what it means to be a newly licensed lawyer, that really forms the foundation for which then you um, can design test questions to then um, uh, combine in some sort of fashion to administer. Next slide, please. And then um, in terms of the structure and decisions, and there was talk earlier today about you know, con compensatory versus uh, conjunctive decisions. We start with an idea though of sufficiency of information. Um, and you know, a, a general question might be, well, should you have a two-day exam, a three-day exam? Well, what does that mean? Well, how much information do you need and how large is the domain from which you want to sample in order to then be able to make a confident decision about whether somebody should earn a credential or not? Part of that determination is to also evaluate how difficult is it to remove a credential from somebody who is found to be incompetent in practice. And that's something um, from a kind of a enforcement of the credential that you can evaluate internally as well. But that sufficiency of information then gets to how confident do we need to be? So the idea of compensatory where we would aggregate performance to determine a passing score where um, I think Dr. Raymond earlier was talking about how you could compensate for you know, um, content and skills with you know, higher, higher performance on one can offset lower performance on others. That, that's a very common strategy within testing because there is an assumption often, often that we are working with a kind of a single unidimensional or common construct for which we're trying to measure. Entry to the legal profession may be one of those. Um, however, I think as Tracy mentioned, there are a number of professions that use multiple hurdles or multiple determinations of passing. Um, architects, for example, have six exams within their licensure process. Accountants have four components for which you have to meet each of those. Dentists have multiple examinations. The driver's license exam has a knowledge component. And then at the, uh, for the initial license, a psychomotor or a skills component where you have to demonstrate that you can safely operate a vehicle. Um, there are multiple examples of how each decision then needs to be supported. And the backing for that, the rationale is really on um, uh, to what extent are there distinct knowledge or skills. Um, I do quite a bit of work with dental examinations. And one of the things that a dentist um, would say is if somebody comes to your office needing um, a root canal, can you compensate by being really good at periodontics or by being able to do a crown, for example? And they would argue, no, that it's a, it's a different skill set. And if you can't demonstrate each of those based on whatever the patients need, then you shouldn't be allowed to kind of independently practice yet. And the characteristics of these are really built on those foundational, um, uh, that foundational knowledge relative to the things that are required for entry level um, job related performance. The way that we evaluate sufficiency as a psychometrician is validity is kind of the overarching theme that we're after of which characteristics of reliability and fairness are components of that. But it ultimately, the, the, the way to make the exam as fair as possible is to always link it back to what is expected for the job and how can you define that in such a way that minimizes 
um, differences in performance while, rep right, while recognizing the fact that educational opportunities and experiences are not equivalent for all applicants. And that's something that starts to show up um, in early years of elementary school. And so um, uh, a licensure exam cannot correct uh, certain characteristics of opportunities for applicants that may have occurred you know, 15, 20 years in advance of when they're uh, participating in the bar exam. So then um, the next step then is, well, how do, we, how do we actually go about administering these examinations? And for that, I'd like to advance to the next slide and turn it over to Joy. Thank you, Chad. And thank you to the entire committee for the opportunity to speak with you. I am Joy Matthews Lopez. I am the founder and president of JML Measurement and Testing Services. Um, I've been a psychometrician for 20 years and I've been working in the licensure and certification space almost all of that time. My particular niche, about 30% of my portfolio has to do with test adaptation. Test adaptation is a process where we take an instrument a test, for example, it could be a survey, from one culture and or language into another language and or culture. And I mention this to you because the crux of the work is around fairness, because fairness is an underlining, a, a huge component of validity. If uh, a candidate is, uh, is uh, if there, there are any barriers or if there are any issues in, um, related to the test, that make it an unfair playing ground, then we don't know how to interpret the resulting score since we have a validity problem. So fairness definitely can trip up our validity arguments. Um, may we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, as both John and Chad have already mentioned, there are different ways to deliver tests. Um, Chad just now outlined computer-based testing versus paper-based, which is where you were, and computer-based where you're, you are right now. And there are different ways to go about delivering a test via computer. And I know that this is a little bit redundant, but I wanted to bring it up because um, sometimes we conflate the issues of how we deliver the test and how we proctor the test. And I wanna talk about proctoring in just a few minutes. So we know our options in terms of delivering a test or how to assemble a test and then how to deliver the test. Um, so if we think in terms of um, you know, our, our old fashioned um, who, what, where, when, how, I don't have anything for who, but in terms of where, or, or in this case, um, how are we gonna to put together our test? We know how we can deliver it. What about our locations, our where? Well, we can deliver in test centers. And I understand you have an, you, you already have a provider in place for 2022. And in addition to having uh, test centers, we also can do event testing. Um, and I believe you're familiar with that concept too, where we, they're all in the convention center or everyone's you know, at four different Hiltons in, in, in a, a certain location. Um, these models give you a lot of control over um, who's touching the test, who's observing the people touching the test. Uh, it's just a lot of control involved. And then there's remote delivery. And remote delivery is, I won't say it's the new frontier, but it's really on our radar right now because of the pandemic. You saw all of the school children flip over to remote learning and remote assessment. All of our universities had to flip over to remote learning and remote assessment, as did when test centers shut down, we had to you know, the certification and licensure needed to, to march on. And it didn't allow us time to do the in-depth research that we needed to do to really round it out. And so I won't say that this is such a new field, but it certainly has not been uh, vetted as carefully as I as a psychometrician would like it to be. Uh, I am not a vendor in terms of remote proctoring. Uh, or remote delivery. So I don't really have a dog in that fight, though I have many clients that want information about remote delivery and remote proctoring. So I'd like to take a second to talk about that. But before I do, the last bullet here is the hybrid model. So just bookmark that for a second. And if I forget, be sure to ask a question about some possible remote options that may be uh, hybrid options that may be helpful to you. Uh, next slide, please. 
So let's talk about exam proctoring. Um, of course, there's in-person, old-fashioned, there are people in the room. And things can go wrong even with in-person proctoring, the collusion, it could be the wrong people in the room. But that's not usually the case. Our test centers are extremely secure and um, event testing is usually very, very secure also. It's a matter of doing due diligence. Have we trained our proctors correctly? Have we standardized the training? How do we have the right models in place uh, in terms of how do we check in people? How do we monitor people? Uh, what, you know, what are our policies and procedures and have they been vetted? Uh, and, and are they right? Do they fit the program? Um, and so we, we know about in-person, but what about this remote piece? Well, there are different types of remote proctoring. Some is assisted with artificial intelligence, with AI. Some is just record and review. Uh, and some programs require live remote proctoring where there is a, a live person as opposed to a non-live person, right? but there's a, there's a person uh, that's uh, actively watching the session. Now, could it be one, one remote proctor watching 40 people? It could happen, uh, hopefully not to any of my clients. Uh, it could be one-on-one, -on -one, which would be maybe a little bit too expensive. And just to say that there are different models. And if we look at various standards for some guidance, uh, you can. Um, there, there are some guidelines coming out. Different white papers are now uh, in the in the field as to recommendations and lessons learned about uh, the ratio between the the proctor and the number of people that the proctor is observing. Um, but again, I, I don't have a dog in this fight. I, I, I'm, you know, I, I, you're not my client. But if, if I were hard pressed to give an, an, a professional opinion here, I would at least say be very, very careful of what type of test you're putting in the field if you're doing remote proctoring. Um, and so again, back to that bookmark we had a few minutes ago, hold it, because we're, we're gonna go back to that in just a second. So, when we look at remote proctoring, there are some issues to consider. One is comparability between um, within the, 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 the candidates, their test experience. Um, do they have um, equal access, access to technology? Do they have uh, equal access to protected space, uh, you know, a quiet place with no distractions? Do they have the same lighting? Do they have the same types of screens with the same resolution? Do they have the, um, do some people have little tiny monitors where it's gonna be harder when the items render as opposed to large screens? Um, are, how familiar are they with technology? Now, seriously, this is not that big a deal in terms of technology. Now, that's not to say things can't go wrong, but you know, I would assume that a, um, a sufficiently um, trained attorney um, would be able to handle a Word document or be able to connect through a Zoom call. And between the two, that's about what it takes to take a remote um, test. So it's, it's not really, you don't have to be a programmer or have serious IT skills, but you do need to be able to follow instructions and you do need to be able to follow links and you need to be able to troubleshoot through a chat box if needed, if things go wrong. And I understand from your last administration that things did go, you know, go bump in the night, but they're, they're not things that can't be overcome and prepare for the next time round where you know what went wrong and you, you know how to prepare for it so you can mitigate those, those kinds of damages and those kinds of risks. Um, and so there's, in terms of fairness, which is what we're really supposed to be talking about, there's that comparability issue. And there's research coming out of um, Pearson View right now, um, uh, and I can give you links to this later if you'd like. There, I mean, there's several papers right now in, in process looking at comparability. So that alone would be have an implication to fairness. But then there's the other issue, and that's exam security. Now, as a psychometrician, and you can ask John or Chad, and you probably get the same answer here, um, context matters. And in this case, the um, your risks in terms of remote proctoring, if you stay with the multiple choice piece or the, um, um, if you're looking just at the MBE, with the rules of NCBE, you don't have to worry too much because that's not going remote. The pieces that could go remote would be the other two pieces, whether it's your MPT or it's the MEE. Uh, and if those were to go remote, what would be the risk here? And 
the big categories of um, that we worry about in test security are proxy testing, where you know my son David shows up and take my son's Dan my son Daniel's test because they, they spit an image of each other. So there's proxy testing, one person substituting for another person. Um, there's also pre knowledge where I'm advantaged because somebody on the East Coast told me what the questions were as I sat to take it on the West Coast. Third problem here would be item harvesting, people stealing your content. And the fourth is collusion. Of those four, two of them don't really pertain to you. You have only one time zone, last time I checked, for California. And so you would start the test all at one time. So I really don't think item harvesting would be your major issue if indeed you dispose of your items or you release your items, you make them go public, as I understand you do. So I don't think that um, we would worry too much about either pre-knowledge or item harvesting. You would have to really focus your efforts on um, containing proxy testing and any kind of collusion, of people helping each other, which is going to lead to something else in just a second. Um, next slide, please. So what about these resources? Um, part of my assignment was to talk about open versus closed book exams and, and context matters. And I believe that it, because there is such a vast amount of information that these folks have to have in their heads, it, it's true that sometimes multiple choice questions, depending on how they're written, um, really do, they're really at a lower level in terms of the cognitive, you know, the cognitive hierarchy. They really are accessing basic information. But there's some basic information that we all should have. I mean, there are things that you, you should just plain old know. You just cold, hard know it. There are other things that we look up. I probably look up things for, I don't know, easily 30% of what I do, do. I have to stop and pull up resources and confirm certain levels. And I would assume that it's reasonable that you do too in your profession. And so I'm not against using, um, uh, having tests, in particular essays, or even your practical exams or your, your practice, your, your performance-based tests, um, being an open book test. I, I can't see the harm of that when they're timed. And I believe right now you've got two questions at 90 minutes a piece. I mean, if I don't know what I'm talking about, if I can't read your question, read your prompt, understand what you need me to you know, how I need to respond, you know, formulate a response, all the resources in the world aren't going to help me, they're going to slow me down. And so in terms of open versus closed books, there are other professions that allow, they allow you to access resources, engineering exams, for example, allow um, um, people to have um, certain approved resources. This also cuts down on the um, how much the proctors have to keep track of. Is this a sanctioned, allowed material versus not? Now, again, open book doesn't always mean just open book willy-nilly. There are certain uh, resources you probably would want to sanction. That, that, that There's some that are allowed, and they would have online access to them through whatever their lockdown browser is if you're doing remote proctoring or in-person in proctoring. You know, if you're in the test center, there's still certain sites that they their um, workstation would be able to access. They would able to be able to pull up certain information that you have approved um, as opposed to go and search for anything that they want to search for. So there are there is precedent. It's not just engineers. There are many, many, many professions that um, allow um, candidates to access uh, approved materials. Um, and so I, I, I don't know what else to say on that one other than I think you're safe going either way. Um, and in terms of fairness, it depends on someone's comfort level. There are people who just like to hold on to Dumbo's feather. And knowing that they can access information actually empowers them to bring it back up out of their heads. And so um, I, I think you're in a win-win um, position when it goes to making that decision. Of course, if you go with the NCBE um, whole package, it's going to limit some of your choices here. But if you do a California-based test, of course, that's going to allow you to uh, have a little bit more wiggle room and make your own decisions. Next slide, please. And then there's the exam timing. Now, I, I'm sure I'm not telling you anything that you've not been told already. There are different ways to administer tests. There's continuous on-demand testing. I, it's two in the morning and I'm in the mood and I'm going to sit for my test. 
as opposed to no, you have to test between this date and this date. I have a hard start and a hard stop. I can test anywhere in that one or two week window or whatever the, the window is between you know, 8 a.m. and 4 p.m., for example. And those would be very specific test windows as opposed to fixed dates. Nope, everybody, the test is gonna be on February 13th this year. And these are the hours from start time to end time. Um, and you just have to look at the what it is you're trying to measure, what accommodations you want to make for everyone, and what fits the culture of your students and what fits the needs of your program. Um, and so it goes back to the psychometrician saying it depends. I am, if I got to pick what my clients would, would choose, I'm really a fan of fixed states because it makes my life easier. Um, that's not to say that it's the right choice for them. It just makes my life much easier when I've got fixed dates. I know what I'm preparing for. I know when the form has to be published and QC'd by. I know, you know, I, I have total control. And I also can clean things up on the backside much faster and easier uh, with my analyses. I can run item analyses all at the same time and not do it in batches. So there are pros and cons, and I'm sure Jim uh, Henderson would be able to guide you through these different options you have, but just wanted to make sure you knew what the options indeed were. Now, I think, is there one more slide? Is it my last one? That, that's the last slide. So that's when we go back to the two, to the quick bookmarks. And I wanted to talk to you about this idea of hybrid testing. If you go with NCBE, um, you still have the option to have your California specific test as well. Um, so let me, having said that, let's talk about if there's any component, whether it's the whole thing or it's just a slice of the pie that is California controlled. You know, I, I worry about you with remote proctoring and I strongly encourage you to be very, very careful with it. Um, and especially if you're doing your knowledge piece with remote proctoring, I'm just, I'm just not a fan. You can ask another psychometrician, you might get another answer. But, um, but I'm just very, very, very careful with that piece. That said, one of my sons is an attorney, my mother-in-law is an attorney, my brother-in-law is an attorney. So I thought I would ask them, hey, how, how would you think the bar exam? And what were the pros and cons? And if you could change something, what would you change? And what concerns did you have? And what if you were allowed to take some of this remotely? What would you do? What would, what would feel right? And in terms of the essays, it occurred to me that it might not be a bad idea. I can't think of a downside of letting people take their essays through remote proctoring. Um, I think I would do it on fixed dates. I'm not sure, but I, if you're going to look at remote proctoring as a serious model going forward, I think that would be a really nice piece to start um, being serious. Um, and if you're looking at remote proctoring for the equivalent of the MBE, I, I, I would be very, very nervous about that. Again, it helps that you're, you're just in California, but not everyone will be just in California when they sit for, for the national test on those very fixed dates. So um, in terms of fairness, um, I, I, I like that you're doing your due diligence. You're really thinking this through. Uh, you're to be commended for the amount of effort you've put into this. And, um, and I was happy to be part of it. So if I can be of any further assistance, let me know. And, and that's all I've got. Thank you so much. And we also have Amy who will be presenting as well before yes. we open it up for questions. Great. Um, what I wanna do is share findings from a few state bar initiatives that are relevant when we're discussing differential performance on examinations. And so I'm gonna start with um, the diff analysis that we conducted in 2019. So uh, next slide, please. Um, diff is a statistical procedure used to evaluate performance patterns on specific questions of, across groups of test takers. Um, and it occurs when test takers uh, uh, of approximately comparable knowledge and skills in different groups perform in substantially different ways to a test question. And what this does is help us identify potential issues in that question. So just to be clear though, it's not synonymous with bias. When diff is identified, there's still a need to explore about what can be contributing to 
that differential. And that's a, a requirement as part of this analysis. Um, and ultimately what it does is it helps ensure that there's fairness in, in tests. So um, next slide, please. I'm gonna describe quickly the methodology that we used for uh, this analysis. Uh, we used 152 written questions, a combination of es uh, essays and PT, 116 essays, 36 PT questions uh, for a 20 year, a, a 10 year exam period. So 20 exams in that 10 year period between 2009 and 2019. And the data is also result from about 72,000, over 72,000 first time exam takers. I'll be reporting on our focus areas, the ones uh, listed here. So gender, race, ethnicity, law school type, subject matter. And um, the analysis was conducted between July or February administrations. I'll focus on uh, the other variables. Um, it's important uh, for uh, to understand of how this that this analysis relies on MBE performance uh, to uh, equate our um, findings. And it's also important to note that diff is uh, the diff flag is based on the size of the difference as well as statistical significance. Next slide, please. So while the overall diff findings didn't demonstrate uh, major concerns, uh, there these are our results. Uh, and our, like I said, I'll focus on gender, race, ethnicity, and, and school type. And as you can see here, female test takers that were flagged for diff were flagged on 20% of the questions in favor of female examinees. Um, also, as for topic areas, uh, diff flags concentrated on subject matters that appear on uh, bar exams less frequently, such as trust, wills, and community property. Next slide. Now, there were very few items flagged for race and ethnicity in, in diff, uh, differential item functioning. The largest number of items that were flagged uh, are in the uh, Black African American diff analysis, so about 16%, followed by Asian at 7%, non Caucasian 5%, um, and Hispanic, Latinos, Hispanic 5%. So although a few items were flagged for race, uh, ethnicity diff, all the flagged items indicated that Caucasians perform better than their focal group after controlling for overall performance on the MBE. Uh, Non-whites had a moderate disadvantage also in the areas of contracts, evidence, professional responsibility, real property, and torts. Next slide, please. Now, in all cases, California ABA law schools were designated as a reference group. Um, and the focal groups uh, for each analysis was the California accredited, California registered, out-of-state ABA uh, attorneys, and those with a foreign uh, JD uh, degree. So 12 uh, or more items were flagged for diff in favor of the California ABA law schools. Of the items flagged, only six favored the focal group after controlling for overall performance on the MBE. A large proportion were flagged it, uh, for diff in the California Registered Law School, 64%, attorney, 55%, and foreign JD, degree, JD degrees in 75%. So while I mentioned that the findings were not uh, a major concern, uh, like needing immediate uh, change, overall the DIF has still proven to be a useful tool to the state bar as it's aiding us in becoming more sensitive to the need to be culturally fair in exam development. As a result of this study, the Board of Trustees directed us to establish a working group that is developing a set of prin uh, guiding principles that will be used during exam development and they're aimed to uh, at reducing potential bias that may lead to differential item functioning. All right. So um, next slide, please. I um, I know I'm running through these. I just want to make sure I ha we have enough time for questions uh, before uh, the session ends. So I now want to highlight uh, data from the post-exam surveys conducted at, after each of our remote exams. Uh, uh, 
uh, Joy mentioned uh, the impact that uh, bar exams and remote bar exams may have on this population. So next, uh, on the testing populations. Next slide, please. Some of the key questions. Oh, so uh, before I get into the questions, let me tell you about our response rate and um, when we offered this. So a survey went out to all exam takers soon, days after taking the bar exam. Uh, we started, we conducted the post exam result uh, survey with every single cohort. So as you can see here, we have the October, 2020, February, 2021 and July, 2021. Um, our response rates uh, are uh, uh, highlighted here, and they um, vary across each of these groups uh, with a higher proportion of female non-ABA graduates and older applicants. Also, surveys were only sent to those who took the exam uh, on a laptop, uh, not in person because the questions pertain to their laptop experience. Next question, uh, next slide, please. All right, so the key questions for this analysis is, we looked at if applicants were required to take the bar exam once more, what was their preferred mode of exam administration? Uh, and what was reported by three of the three cohorts of remote exam takers? Also, how much previous computerized ex exam experience uh, applicants had prior to taking the bar remotely? how technology or having a distraction-free environment was experienced by different testing populations and what impact it had on their exam experience. Also, whether applicants' experience during the exam affected their satisfaction with the overall experience of a remote computer-based exam. Next slide. So here I'm going to describe the different categories. So uh, one of the questions we asked is, if you had to sit for the remote bar exam in the future, uh, what would your preferred, preferred modality be? And the options were to take the uh, exam on a computer in an isolated environment, meaning in your could be your home in a personal office setting versus uh, on a computer in a group setting, such as uh, the way we do that now for in-person examinations. Also, the option you had is you had no preference or in a group without a computer that is on paper um, and most likely handwriting. As you can see here, 90% of, of, of overall applicants selected a computer-based format in some uh, shape or another. Uh, the majority of those applicants wanting a computer or uh, preferring uh, taking it on a computer in a, an isolated environment. All right, next slide, please. Now, this question was about uh, the uh, whether uh, act, having access to, uh, to an environment that was distraction free. Here, you could see the variance uh, between uh, each of the three exam cohorts. Approximately 60 to 65% of the exam takers indicated that their environment. Uh, for the exam was free of distractions. Uh, applicants identifying with, uh, uh, as a person with a disability reported uh, being challenged with having a distraction environment compared to applicants overall by 8% more. Also ABA graduates and younger applicants tend to express more concern over a distraction free environment. Oh, one more thing I wanted to say about that. Um, as we plan for the remote exam, we were made aware that applicants may not have had adequate testing space at home. So what we did is we offered uh, applicants who had that concern testing, testing space. That is, if they had issues or concerns about their Wi-Fi capacity at home or in an office setting or the need to be isolated from household members, uh, that was one of the... Uh, the, one of the uh, possibilities that we had for all three uh, remote exam administrations. All right, uh, next, please. We asked applicants about their previous experience with computerized exams. And this was an effort to learn a little bit more about our exam need pool. And the responses here, is, uh, responses here you can see vary uh, significantly. Uh, not only over the three exam administrations, but also through various uh, subgroups. 
uh, by demographics um, and other factors. So here among uh, race and ethnicity, those who had a lot of experience range from 35% uh, for Asians uh, to 52% for whites. Uh, as you can see, our graduates of California AP law schools had more experience with computerized exams uh, with 62% indicating a lot compared to 26% for those from other school types, which include attorneys from other states and foreign countries. The wide variance among school types is also exhibited in age ranging from 62% of exam takers under 30 uh, years of age and 25% for those over 50. Among exam takers who grew up speaking non-English, only 37% selected a lot related to the 54% of um, English speakers. And uh, there were no differences between uh, female and male applicants. Next slide, please. As for having issues obtaining internet access, as you can see here, uh, as you can see here uh, with our three cohorts, the October 2020 applicants was a, uh, the first cohort taking the bar exam online had the highest level of issues with technology. Uh, variance among subgroups is relatively small regarding issues in obtaining uh, uh, access. Minority women and applicants identifying as having a disability have more issues in obtaining internet access. Uh, one thing to note too, is that we selected a vendor that would not need continued access throughout the exam. And uh, nonetheless, uh, having uh, uh, internet was needed um, at least at the onset to, uh, to uh, validate somebody's um, uh, validate that the person was taking the exam and to access the questions. All right, next uh, slide, please. All right, so this graph, I wanna take a moment to highlight. It, um, it highlights how uh, applicants reported any interference as well as what their overall satisfaction was with the exam process. As you can see here, the highest level of satisfaction was reported by the February 2021 exam cohort. And they also have the lowest reporting of interference or concentration um, or progress during the exam. They also had, um, oh, here we can see that uh, also applicants identifying themselves as disability reported high levels of satisfaction with the exam. And also in a multivariate model controlling all variable, uh, all available uh, relevant factors, satisfaction levels are not affected by race, ethnicity, gender, first generation in college and growing up in a non-English household. Next, please. Now, um, Oh, sorry, before we move on, I do want to highlight in the previous screen, there's one caveat I want to point out uh, related to the July 2021 uh, interference that's noted here. As you can see, that bar graph compared to the other uh, previous cohorts is higher at 67%. And this is reflected by the um, impact that uh, Dr. Matthews Lopez pointed out earlier, and that is that they, this is a, probably a reflection of those that were affected by the nationwide technological issue reported by uh, our vendor ExamSoft. Uh, so that interference is uh, of one of the, what could be highlighted here. Next, please. All right. Here um, is the overall experience itself. So as you can see here, this is looking at the relationship between the exam experience and performance. And here, uh, as you can see, the this is looking at pass rate. So those that had no interference had a 52% pass rate, uh, while those that had interference had a 57% pass rate. You look at uh, in terms of satisfaction, those that were dissatisfied or did not have a, an opinion, we're looking at a 60% pass rate and those that were satisfied out of 51. It appears that the relationship between those two are counterintuitive. 
there's a higher passage correlated with more interference and lower satisfaction. And this is controlling for uh, additional factors in a multivariate model, um, uh, neither showed any impact. Okay, next slide. Uh, the, given that we're talking about access and fairness, I want to highlight exam costs for a moment because it has implications on this issue. So um, next slide. I have one slide just to demonstrate a comparison of costs uh, between these two exams uh, or exam modalities. You look here, this is a comparison of 2019 ex uh, exam costs in certain categories. Uh, 2019 consisted of two in-person exams compared to 2020, uh, where we had one in-person exam and a remote exam held at the height of the pandemic. As you can see here, in each of these categories, testing site facilities, security guards, on-site uh, telephone service and electrical service, on-site proctors, exam software fees, and material delivery, nearly all of the categories yielded cost savings with the exception of the laptop fee. And the laptop fees, this is due to the fact that we're using three types of software. You know, we used the one that uh, uh, collected applicant responses, the one that also used uh, the system to monitor uh, applicants as they're going through the system and to validate their identification. So essentially for this, these exam cycles, we pay for three licenses when we regularly pay for one uh, at in-person exams. Uh, which is why that costs nearly doubled for these exams. But what's critical to note here that is in comparison, um, this comparison involves also exams that were held during the pandemic um, and at the height of that, which required more testing space and proctors due to the fact that applicants were on site in individual hotel rooms. Uh, normally for in-person exams, applicants sit in shared spaces, uh, auditoriums, smaller conference rooms, and so um, when this wasn't allowed for the, during the pandemic, we spent significant, significantly more on testing facilities, despite not using that much space. Uh, post pandemic, we can anticipate that we'll need less, uh, not as many hotel rooms or proctors, which will result in greater cost savings. Um, again, I raised this uh, item just to give you a sense of how cost examinations uh, compared in an in-person exam to a, a remote setting uh, because it has implications on accessibility for our applicants. All right, with that, I will stop and hand it over to uh, you, Justice. Thank you all again, and I'll um, open it up for questions for any of the presenters. Um, I, I just had a quick question on the presentation about the various alternatives that might be more or less helpful. And one of them um, specified that modifying the test, the testing time was under the category of less helpful. And I was just wondering what the, that was based upon. Um, well, that was, uh, I think the, um, the underlying research was based on, I think, educational testing time limits. Uh, using uh, with cognitively oriented tests, and I think adjusting several several different projects that were evaluating uh, where they had the opportunity to evaluate the effect of the testing time limit, and whether uh, like removing a time limit or just in increasing it would it would have an impact, and uh, so that was the context, and and I think I I think I said that. It didn't have much of an effect in reducing differences, and the reason was because I think it, it benefited pretty much. Every, it benefits everyone, so uh, so it doesn't really re it didn't reduce differences. Um, okay, thank you, yep. Neil, and then Tracy. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Um, so I, I was curious uh, specifically about the issue about the different path rates and the different performances for people uh, for minority groups specifically. Um, I, I, I wanted to see what you folks thought about um, the productive mindset intervention that the bar has been doing, or it's also been called bar exam strategies, where um, uh, if you're enrolled in that program, you receive a lot of um, positive reinforcement leading up to the exam. 
uh, success stories of the folks who who've become lawyers and passed the exam. What are your, what are your thoughts about that? Because my understanding is that that program resulted in, in uh, like a double digit increase uh, in pass rates for minority groups. But what are your thoughts about programs like that? Well, I I'll, I can start the start the conversation, and Chad and uh, and um, Joy can weigh in, but. Yeah, I think that's one of the strategies that that's in alignment with strategies for, I think, test preparation, coaching, and other programs that help um, that help individuals prepare. And I and I and I do think that is um, there has been a, a track record record of success in a number of organizations like that. I was involved in a, a different, much different context, but I worked with the city of New York. Uh, they had to replace their uh, uh, selection program for entry-level firefighters for FDNY, which had been litigated quite a bit. And um, so a big part of that was candidate preparation. And we worked with the fire department and the union, uh, the Vulcan Society, to create um, preparation programs that were, that were beyond just the exam, but you know, strategies for preparing and being successful. So I think it's, a, from my perspective, it sounds like a very good program. I'd agree with that. I mean, anything that helps to offer um, additional education or experience opportunities, and particularly those around test taking, I mean, you can look at um, test taking performance or behaviors as something that really cuts across professions, content areas that, um, uh, educators are really not that great in terms of assessment literacy. And so they're really good at their, their content knowledge and the ability oftentimes to deliver that. But in terms of then, how do you help uh, applicants or candidates demonstrate that knowledge, the test taking strategies about how to do that in particularly the different um, approaches or item types is definitely something that I think is, is valuable. Yeah, I, I, I agree with what John and Chad just said. I think it's a great idea. It, it's not surprising at all. We see this in other areas. We see this in, in um, academic institutions where there are um, programs specifically to help even the playing field um, and uh, putting those test wiseness skills and test taking skills in place. And we see very good results. Yeah, and also addresses the, the uh, what's been labeled imposter syndrome, right? Who are you asking? No, oh, any of you. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if I've heard much about, I'll be honest, I don't know if I've heard much about the imposter syndrome, but I have heard a lot about, I'm hearing more, you know, especially with testing at home um, and different testing environments, just people are bringing up test anxiety. Um, and is it, you know, and, the, and it's being brought up actually in the context of at home versus in test centers. And I hear, I hear arguments on both sides that testing at home is less, less, anxiety producing and others say it's more anxiety producing <laughs> uh, depending on, the, on your home environment but uh i know that was a tangent but um at any rate that's what i hear more about that than i have been hearing about imposter so neil that would not surprise me at all um yeah. you know with imposter syndrome it's not that someone doesn't know something it's a, on the contrary and yeah. so again this is a way to even the playing field well thanks and just as a quick follow up on that, I think it's actually intended to, it's, it's a reduction of stereotype threat more so than imposter syndrome, probably, um, just for, for what it's worth. Yeah, I agree, Chad. Thank you. Tracy? Yes, um, good afternoon. Uh, again, want to thank you all for your presentation. Um, Joy, I appreciate your um, very delicate um, concerns raised about remote uh, proctored testing. I share those with you. Uh, many of our programs, most of them, in fact, at DCA do not use remote proctored exams uh, during COVID. Um, and Chad, thank you uh, again for sharing your opinions about compensatory models or some of your statements. Um, because really we are looking at an, a totality of construct, you know, within an occupation or professional licensing. All this information was very helpful. 
And uh, John, I just wanted, if you could, to talk a little bit about um, some of the cons associated with the alternative me methods that you raise, the situational judgment scenarios, structured oral interviews, performance-based. I know they're really great, um, but, and I guess you can talk about the pros too, but what, you know, in your experience with licensing and testing, um, how frequent do you see those utilized? Because again, I know at DCA, we have definitely, we're moving toward um, non-performance-based clinical exams, and then COVID really sped that up. Uh, we've had a lot of problems with reliability, uh, rate or error, um, just very massive, messy, very costly. So do you see some trends at all? Um, or again, your opinion with say, how this would relate to the bar exam given their population of candidates? Yeah, um, well, great question. You know, obviously um, th there are more costs involved. Uh, and and the, the, the first things that come up typically in the conversation are the cost and scalability of, more, of a more performance-oriented assessment. Uh, so especially like in oral assessments, which could be very uh, relevant in, you know, in a, for a bar exam or, um, or related to that, or simulations, they tend to be more costly to develop and to implement and they're harder to scale. Uh, so right now, there, I'd say I'm seeing more limited use, but I, I, I'm, an, I'm optimistic. I don't know what the near-term horizon is, but there are a lot of technology solutions that are in development. They, 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 I wouldn't call them state of the art yet. You know, I'd call them, you know, more leading edge or bleeding edge. Uh, that may not factor in in the near term, but but I think that's where it's. I, I do think that kind of assessment is on the horizon. But um, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, in licensing, you know, we're seeing more focus on practical exams. Obviously, the kind of Things that were mentioned earlier. So, in, in in medical and clinical exams, you know, the objective clinical uh, score, you know, the OSCE approach is still still being used. There are technology solutions being, you know, uh, looked at that as well. But, um, you know, it's a great question. It's still, a, I think, we're still in the challenge state of cost scalability versus um, and 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 being able to have make reliable decisions on on mass. So those are the those are the challenges. Thank you. And I'd just like to conclude with a comment that if um, this committee or, or other committees do want to ever explore computer-based testing, we work closely with PSI and um, we have lots of data showing what a positive experience it is for our candidates. We were able to con continue testing uh, for most of uh, 2020 uh, during the pandemic. Um, and um, there is a lot of information and ways of testing. And as John mentioned, technology is getting better. We're looking forward to exploring different types of, of uh, item types, um, but there's really a lot you can do in terms of accessibility, fairness, uh, addressing reasonable accommodation and things like that. So thank you. Thank you. And I'll just end by saying I'd be happy to, you know, there's so much, you know, we sort of scratch the surface. I'd be happy to engage in any further conversations, you know, as needed. Thank you. And Karen has an additional question. Uh, and, and again, I'm going to add my thanks to everybody. Um, I, I would just, it's, it's as much as a, it's, it's a question and a caution, which is some of the, some of the sort of computer aided testing technologies really bring into the center of the conversation, really critical data policy and, and sort of AI policy questions. And I, I just, that that's a whole separate category of consideration that we haven't really touched on in these conversations. So if we're gonna trend in that direction, I would just encourage us to add to our knowledge base there. Thank you, Karen. Are there any additional questions? 
Um, if not, I again wanted to repeat what everyone has said, but thank you so much for your presentations here today. It's been very helpful to us. And again, we appreciate your time. Thank you. And we will um, go on to the, well, there's a couple of additional agenda items, but I'm concerned about the time. It's 12.29 and we're only scheduled to go through 12.30. Um, just briefly, we did have on here an agenda item for a possible recommendation, if you were ready to make one to the entire commission as to what direction you think the, the group should go, uh, California-based bar exam, the next gen or no exam at all. Um, but I, I don't think that there's sufficient time for us to, to vote on that or discuss the three options. And, um, you know, I'll ask for others' opinions, but it might make sense since we could have approached it a, a, a couple of different ways, but we do have one additional meeting that we can allot in January to maybe a, a more in-depth discussion of these three options so that we're not making a decision that's rushed at this point. Does anyone have any comments on that, Amy? Just as, um, it, you know, if if we're going to wait to um, have, uh, you know, share thoughts about where people are leaning, um, perhaps one thing um, we can combine it with this discussion on next steps is to learn, are there different knowledge areas that would be helpful in shaping that discussion uh, or uh, shaping that decision uh, what could we, what could we bring as part of uh, the decision making to the January meeting? Yes, thank you. So I'll open it up for suggestions on that. I had a thought just listening to some of the comments about, uh, you know, the flexibility that we would have with the California bar exam approach versus the next gen. And I was wondering if there's any ability to negotiate with the NCBE on some of the aspects of remote in-person open book, uh, anything at all, or if we already know the answer to that and whether that's just no. We have reached out, you know, um, for example, about uh, it, you know, the current exam, um, you know, uh, pre uh, uh, next gen, and um, and uh, so I think what we need to do is reach out um, and explore the ability. Um, there are there are concerns around security. You know, what we get from the MBE is a very um, it's a very protected exam. So, um, but I think we can uh, go back and perhaps talk about in terms of the next gen exam, as you've suggested, um, any potential for negotiation on uh, the possibility of remote. Well, I do think I do think this is one of the areas where they've got some firmness in their decision, uh, right? In terms of the, even the presentation today, they talked about this will be a computer uh, delivered exam at test centers or at jurisdiction controlled sites, i.e. like the convention centers or hotels where we where we put this on. Um, you know, NCB has always been willing to listen to um, what, you know, what we've presented to them, but this is something that we will obviously go back to them again. But I, um, I, I think this is the issue of remote, the issue of sort of closed book versus open book. I think these are things that are that are fairly fundamental in their mindset um, that they've got decisions on and that they're, you know, it wouldn't be remote, it wouldn't be, it, it wouldn't be open book, um, that those are, I, I don't think there's flexibility on that, but we will, we will certainly have a further conversation and present you back with everything that we hear um, in the next conversation on that. Okay, thank you. Karen and Natalie. Sorry, just a quick question, and I may have missed it, but are, are we confident that if we went with the NCBE that we would have reciprocity in other jurisdictions, or do we still deal with the accredited law school problem? Right. I mean, what, are, we, are we buying a lot of reciprocity opportunity with that solution, or do we still have the same challenges that we essentially have today? I think 
it, uh, it does not guarantee reciprocity. I think we still need to reach out to jurisdictions. Uh, there's um, uh, uh, probably a possibility of, uh, there's a greater ease to do that because there's you know, comparability in terms of the exam score, but in terms of uh, you know, policy-wise, um, we would need to reach out to each of the jurisdictions um, in order to make that determination. And I think also uh, one thing that was pointed out is the need to determine also uh, the policy decision of, of uh, accepting as much as uh, being accepted um, in other jurisdictions as well. We'd have to explore all of that. Natalie? So my uh, suggestion was also about reciprocity. Amy asked if there's any information that can be brought to the table the next time we meet. And I think I'd want more information, even if it is a very informal um, survey of other jurisdictions. Um, and if at all possible, what the Supreme Court is thinking as far as accepting other uh, or accepting uh, attorneys from other jurisdictions, because I think at least as I've understood some of the comments and concerns is that reciprocity is a um, is something that's appealing about going the UBE jurisdiction, but based on today's conversations and presentations, I'm not sure that it is. It's either or. It sounds like reciprocity is still an issue, whether we do California specific or if we went UBE. So I think it'd be good for us to just understand what are we gaining, if anything, by going either direction on, on that point. So any information the staff members could provide before that meeting or at the meeting would, would I think help me uh, better uh, or make a better informed decision. Yes, uh, and we could um, explore this and bring it to the committee. No, we'll piggyback on that. If there's any um, you know history to this policy, um, I would love to sort of understand that a little bit more because I, I know we have this reciprocity um, uh, require uh, a lack of reciprocity, but I just don't understand the policy reason behind it or the history for that matter. And I think a lot of it's a chicken and egg, right? So, and I don't know, I don't know who's the chicken and who's the egg, but, um, but right, reciprocity is a two-way street and, um, and California doesn't offer reciprocity to others and others don't offer reciprocity to California. Not quite sure where that started. Certainly we know one of the, one of the barriers has been um, most states, and I haven't looked at every state's policy certainly, but most states really do, um, most states only have ABA uh, approved law schools and limit who can, uh, limit who can, um, uh, who can be admitted to the bar to those who are from ABA approved law schools. And so because California is unique in, um, in all of the different pathways to entry to admission um, and the, the, the large numbers of, um, of law schools that are not ABA approved, there's been that, there, there's been a resistance to allowing anybody who didn't come from a California ABA approved law school to be admitted into into another bar, and so, um, and so that's you know obviously a question that 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 this group and and the court you know would ultimately need to consider is um, is you know would the commission want to for example go to the UBE if it meant that those from ABA law schools ABA approved law schools would have that portability, but but every but everyone else coming from any other law, uh, pathway to law in California would not, right? It's it's you know certainly a direction that I could see some people interested in going and others absolutely not interested in going, um, and so that's ultimately something for for consideration. Um, but yeah, I think we had talked previously about doing a survey of um, of uh, of all the other jurisdictions and talking about if California sort of has its own exam, if California and you other state go with the next gen exam what are the what, what would be you know what what kind of portability would would there be just a quick, quick follow up so if there will be a survey of these jurisdictions i would ask that um that question of one whether they would be willing to accept a uh, reciprocity so our california applicants that it would be separated 
from you know ABA and non-ABA law schools so that they're not just seeing that question as an all or nothing um, for us to think about at least. Yep. Are there any other suggestions for future discussion topics or information? Okay, well, I think at this point, since we're past the time period, we've gone through the agenda items and we'll, um, I'll ask if there's any additional business that anyone wants to discuss. Okay, so that does conclude the business portion of the agenda. We'll take the information that's been provided to us uh, regarding next steps and also come up with additional ideas for our next business meeting. And that next meeting, I believe, will be in the new year. Um, I want to say January 4th. Mm -hmm. Yes, January 4th of 2022. So I look forward to seeing you all then. And thank you that the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Happy holidays. Happy holidays.